this is episode five of Oversight. I'm the usual host, Thorin. Got Monty here. And obviously, Monty, if this was like a, an alternate universe, and we start in one of our talk shows, and I was like, and the guest is Flame. Everyone would be like, yes. <laughs> Thor, Thorin find it. Everyone think it makes logical sense, right? Because Thorin's favorite player is Flame in League of Legends. Flame now plays in the North American LCS in League of Legends. This could have happened, Monty. This actually could have either. But you had to go and ruin everything with your Overwatch thing and the whole Riot thing. And all. Yeah, so, no, Monty, we are, the guest is Flame. But it's not the League of Legends player. So, okay. It's pr still pretty good, but it's not a player. So, <laughs> Well, this, especially yeah, considering that on. apparently Flame is taking like 12 hours a week of English or something like that on Immortals. Not this one again, just to confirm. The, the League of Legends player. This guy speaks <laughs> 100 hours a week in English. In fact, <laughs> as far as I know, his English is quite good, Monty. Almost fluent. <laughs> almost native level fluent. So... Here's the thing. Since Monty, what I did is I started to warm him up, you know, because well, let's face it, we all know it. A lot of players are kind of pea brains, you know, they can't really articulate themselves well. So I had to get Monty into the game, but I had to kind of blood him to the sport, you know. I couldn't just like throw him at the deep end. I had to put him in there, you know, first of all, I put him in there, like somebody who speaks Swedish, so like, you know, they're a bit all over the place. Then I, then I put him in with Dummy, who looks at all times like he has some sort of mad reaction gif game going on where every time you're talking, he's like, he really does. It just looks to me like that girl from the ring. It was really freaky, but perfectly fine person. That was just his reaction game. That's his natural resting face. So the thing is, I saw Monty who's getting a bit cocky, right? He made a clip. He started to upload clips now. Oh, you do any clips, I see. You already, you know, not like <laughs> League of Legends where you used to break all down the whole game, remember, Monty? But no, 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 no. You just break down one point now. Okay, so you're gradually working your way in. See, this is the thing about Monty. He doesn't put himself out there. Emotionally unavailable. No, he just doesn't put himself out there fully. <laughs> he gradually, he waits until he's got his confidence for fun. Okay, so I know he still hasn't done whole games though, Monty. So what I thought is right. Well, you want to fuck around with clips? Then this guy, Flame, does the whole game, Monty. He, he just take a whole game. <laughs> hey, I do the whole game like, too live. Yeah, but he has the the benefit of doing it after the fact when he knows what's happened in some senses. So he <laughs> is a better than yours, I'm afraid, Monty, because since you're reacting in the moment, you you just have to make that shit up. So that's a that's a flaw to having to do it live. If anything, he's ahead of the game. Well, he's after the game actually, but he's ahead of the game <laughs> metaphorically, and he's, he's ahead of the after the game. Yeah, he's I after actually the usually game. don't watch them live. I like hate watching okay. them live. But you know the, the rough the rough outcome though, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Whereas Monty, he just he's just a prisoner of the moment. He just has to res respond to whatever happens in that moment. For all he knows, Doa might just make an an attempt at an amusing pop culture reference right before when Monty would have stopped the the screen. He would have zoomed in. He would have replayed it again. He, uh, that's the thing actually. Monty does when he does his VOD review type things. What he'll do is like even though. If he was articulating stream of consciousness style, he would just say what he was seeing. Right, he'd go, like, "Oh, well, they've done some complete mistake here. This is a real flaw. Let's look at that again." He'll just be like, "What is? What is this?" And then he, he like pulls like, like he's trying to be like the teacher, you know? It's like trying to be very illustrative. Like, let's. What? I need to see that again. Like, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's just a, a weird way that you have a dude. I don't know why you do it that way. Because I, it's more I know you. It's more, yeah. it's more condescending that way. It know? is. It, it's incredibly condescending. <laughs> like, as though, as though, like, it, like you're basically like that hackneyed cliche of you know in American movies. It's only in American movies this exists. Where you know they they. There's some sort of a chase scene going on and you know it's like an alien fighting a cop or something and they bust through a window and then there's some drunk there and he's drinking at the side of the sidewalk and then after they run away he looks at the kind of like the wine like yikes if this is i must be so drunk and throws the wine away like that's like your style and that's just like you can't even believe what's happening in front of your eyes so you <laughs> must see it again i can't believe my brain is processing the, the simulation like this I, I have to see it again rewind a glitch in the matrix as it were so, to start this episode, we've actually got some very fresh, for us, obviously this will be out in like a day for everyone else, we've got some very fresh information, which is that IDDQD has joined NRG. So let's start with that. Flame, what do you think of IDDQD joining NRG, former Fnatic player? Mm, I mean, results will be the, out. Like <laughs> results will speak for themselves with that team. Like they just, they must have spent a lot on the buyout from Fnatic, because I don't think he really left on the greatest of terms. I heard the buyout was outrageous. Wait a minute, so wait a minute. That, 
that is like an incredibly political start to an answer. Well, I think. Um, results, I mean, if you want the real well, yeah. answer, they're probably okay. going to suck even worse. That's what uh, I like, wanted. Yes, but I'm not sure. Like he's such a talented player at what he does. It's just you put too many titans on one team and personalities start clashing. I don't. Re- I haven't heard the best stories from how that team is ran. I guess like I love Siegel to death, but. He picked up his like best friend as the coach. He just cut a bunch of his friends, and now they're going to like really, really top tier players as like their saving grace. But I don't know if that's really the move. I mean, what would be the move? I think that their their little friendship club was not working, so you might as well try and get the best free agents available, right? And if you think about an actual fit here, if you are going to move towards a hit scan player when Seagull primarily plays uh, projectile DPS, then IDQD is probably just from a skill level the best available free agent that is out there right now. Now, we can ask questions about why did he leave Fnatic, and there are stories out there of him having a difficulty of getting along with the other players, but at a certain point, that actually does have to come down to the management of energy, right? And part of part of what happens a lot of the time with new esports or these new teams is they don't have a manager and they don't have a coach to keep somebody in line, and we could talk about energy's infrastructure, but they did get a new president uh, you know, recently, who has been with the team now for a while, um, that it, it, he came in before they had a lot of these issues with their roster. So I think that their management has changed up quite a bit. Um, they have a coach now, so maybe they can actually get things rolling. Whether or not the coach being Seagull's friend, which I think is risky, personally, uh, to have somebody that close to you in a position of authority. Seagull. It's fantastic. Well, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, depends who you are. It's all maybe about perspective. Not, maybe that. not good for energy, the team, though, right? I mean, yeah, I guess from my perspective that the TF2 team should have been able to perform better. Like, I think Enigma's probably a top-tier player in his own right. I think Clockwork's DPS ability is, like, his hit scan is also great. I think that there's bigger problems, though, than just, like, individual talent. So, like, filling individual talent with different individual talent, I don't know if it's... I mean, from my perspective, I don't think it's going to help. Okay, so if you say that though, like, what if? Okay, if if you didn't know the roster was changing, okay, you didn't know any of the lineup was going to change. You a roster move isn't the isn't the solution. Like, could they have kept the old lineup and were the pieces there to be better? But I think it goes back to like the whole Western infrastructure thing of just coaching and analysis just not being as strong as in. Korea right now. I think like you could have coached that team to have been better or have put less power in different players' hands in such a way that it wouldn't be a toxic environment for the players that weren't so high profile to have made a better impact. So wait a minute, when you say that part there, like like the like, essentially they, if they could you could have essentially answered yes, like they could have just not made a roster move. Yeah. And the pieces were with in your move world with, with coaching to become better and to become a really good team. I don't know, man. That but, was the whole thing about we were both at LG Vegas. Like I gave them a pass on their last game in Korea because they had just changed the roster. But like at a certain point after they left Korea and got eliminated in the group stage of the first season of Apex. MLG Vegas was where they should have had a month to gel in a month, and they they sucked. They played terribly at MLG. I they mean, they're really bad. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing that. I just don't think that the, I wouldn't have put. I don't think that switching the players out is going to solve the issues that they had at MLG. I don't think it was like an individual skill problem. I think well, it was like a teamwork and like coaching and just overall game strategy problem that just pulling in a new McCree player is not going to solve for them so this team had that team had all the all the pieces to you that team could have been a tier one team easily with the proper infrastructure and not having the toxic environment of having like two strong like if you have one player or two players that are way too overpowering in the team environment it obviously will start to trickle into the mentality of the rest of the team like i don't think it was a healthy environment for them but i think from a talent perspective it was more than enough to have been a top contender at, in any meta, arguably. Okay. So you think the the players who are no longer in that team, they'll go off and they'll be um, make it to the top elsewhere? Or would they uh, have to be that unit yes. together, do you think? No, no, for sure. I think if they really wanted to, they could do it, 100%. I think Enigma is probably one of the best players in the game. He just never really got to show it. Um, I think Clockwork will find his rhythm eventually, and I've heard nothing but good things about Milo, but it's hard to tell. I mean, when you're playing tank and... The game is falling apart. It's hard to gauge how well you're doing, right? 
Okay. So, so, you, so then here's the question: If that's your like, if that's your basic premise for that team, is if you say like some of the star players or whatever maybe had more pull. Why didn't Siegel play better in the team then? I mean, in theory, he was like the guy who surely had massive pull within that team. I thought at MLG especially he was he was like playing super well. It's just okay. Overwatch is one of those games. I, I think Overwatch is different from a lot of games right now where. If you have like one problem, like even if it's like your healers aren't healing the right person or your ults are off by like two or three seconds, you'll just start losing all of your matches. And it's very, I mean, it's obvious, I guess, when you watch I mean, matches I think, back. But I think, I think it was more than that. I mean, they did have that one. What was that? They were like six ults to zero and they couldn't take a point or something at MLG, if I recall correctly. Exactly. Like, but like, who's, whose fault is that, right? Is that like, that's like a team problem. That's not like an individual. I know, but at a certain you know point, six, six ults to zero. Oh, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm losing that. I'm not like defending them. I'm saying, it's I'm uniquely saying, like, pathetic. I'm saying if you swap out the players, I don't know that that six ult problem goes away. Okay, well... I will okay. just disagree there. Like well, I don't think I don't think it, you know, given the time that they had with the coach that they had, that switching the coach would have solved that problem. There was obviously a fundamental uh, inability to work together there. And if it was little tweaks, I could understand what you're saying. But they played so badly that yeah, I wait, think that, got. But, but like, I, right, in my eyes, I don't think they got rid of the players that were causing the fundamental problems. Okay, there we go. Now we're at Simonti. <laughs> we keep digging, and eventually we're getting somewhere. We struck. The gold, I believe. The problem <laughs> is, problem is, Flim, they only kept two players. And one, he was on the last show, and he doesn't have a super strong personality in theory. So what's your, what, like, what's your perspective? What, what could they, if you say they didn't get rid of those players? Okay, I'm not trying, I don't want to grill anybody, but from okay. what I've heard and from who I, like, I know them. I played TF2 with them for, like, 10 years. Like, I've known Dummy for five, six years. I, like, went to okay. TIs with him. Like, we're friends. It's just... His personality is very um, strong. I mean, and that's like a fine thing. Like him and Siegel have very strong personalities. If you get into an argument with either of them, it's like, no, you're wrong. And like, that's just how they operate. And that's not really a fault of theirs. It's just, it doesn't clash well with other players. And yeah. when you get into like player politics on a team where there's obviously like one player has more power, they're getting paid more, they have more publicity and more pull in management's decision-making I think when you start saying like, oh, maybe I should do this or X, Y, and Z, and then maybe someone disagrees, but there's no strong voice because your coach is best friends with your star player. So anything that the star player says goes, and then the coach is afraid to speak against the star player or a dummy in that case, because they're also great friends. Like that whole team is like way too incestuous in like the okay flame. friendship this, is uh, yeah, i don't know here's, here's what's bizarre initially you sounded like you were really down on energy because of the new lineup then you sounded like you uh, like somehow despite the incredible land failures of that team you're like the number one fanboy of that team ever like they can still do it give give, <laughs> no, give no, tony one more chance the cowboys no, 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 can still do it like think... like you were just all in somehow <laughs> I, i'm great i'm great with them switching players i just don't think it's gonna show up in the results okay so here's the question though at the end of when we when we when we took you through the circuitous route of how you see NRG, at the end it sounds like your premise was really good team. Let's just kick Siegel and possibly Dummy <laughs> also off that team. Keep the rest of the team intact. Put in two new players, and then that's a that's a better approach. It's no, just, just I not, think it's more is that too you far. Need less you need to take power away from the players okay. and start putting it into the management role that isn't the best friend of the players. So you're saying you want to see them with a different coach? A hundred percent. All right, we finally got an answer. Oh, but okay. it was it was a long and winding road there for a little bit. I mean, I went I went around <laughs> it saying like I think okay. that they could have done fine, but they had the wrong game plans and they had the wrong strategy. I mean, you don't want to call out Sam, but at the end of the day, I don't think that it was smart to put the best friend of your star player as the coach of the team. I, like I don't see how that would ever be beneficial. If IDDKD gets into an argument here, like he's going to be up against Sam now, who's still best friends with. Siegel. So, how, like, how do you ever really solve internal conflicts when it's obviously biased? You just got to get a really amazing at internal conflicts. Now you got to win like one v twos, one v threes. If you do that, then you fucking you deserve it. you're the best yes, internal conflict of all time. So. Win, man, yeah, no. exactly. It's all about the competition, the desire to win. So, okay, here's the question: then. You say like, oh, if they just had like better coaching, or if better coaching had existed in the West, does that? 
Like, is that coaching even conceivable? It sounds like you want fucking Mary Poppins to come in and just fix the entire thing <laughs> no, miraculously. No, I, think, I think that there's a fundamental problem with the Western Overwatch scene in this way that they created teams at the, from the get-go. Like, even for me, I've been approached to coach, and, like, I don't want... You don't want to coach a team that exists, that has its own internal friendships already, like, their own, like, standpoints. And and, yeah, like, it's... There's... I The reason why I switched to analysis was because I wanted to get away from the player politics. Like, I was on a team, and I got cut because of player politics, like, not getting along with the person who's closest to the management. And you don't like going into that whole ecosystem just sounds awful and i think the problem right now is that a lot of the players just keep thinking that they can replace a player or two to just get results and that's been yeah. like the ongoing trend on the western teams like they'll just keep swapping rosters and players get kicked and there's like stupid scandals every week and i think that it stems from a greater problem that the orgs just didn't invest in better management and coaching from the get-go to create these rosters to like help iron out these issues that seem so obvious. Well, to be fair to the organizations, um, based on the current knowledge that they have over the future of the Overwatch scene because of the limited information they have from Blizzard, it hasn't, I think from their perspective, like they want to be a part of Overwatch and they are waiting until they get further information about Overwatch League before they start investing more. So they're in this, there's a weird situation that's developing right now where I agree with you that it's time to really start building out better management, uh, you know, putting more resources, uh, coaches, analysts into these teams. But teams don't want to make those investments if they're not going to be guaranteed a franchise slot in the Overwatch League. So I think that you're, you're, you and I and everybody else so not going to get what we want out of this competition until the franchising actually occurs, right? At that point, people will have all these resources and also the shenanigans will stop, right? Because you're not going to be able to swap all your players every week. If Mark Cuban comes in and buys a team, he's not going to put up with these, you know, little shits uh, desires to change their, pro you know, fix their problems by swapping out players all the time. That literally won't be able to happen. And people are going to have to grow up and learn how to fix their, their issues internally instead. And they'll have more resources to do that as well. Yeah, but I mean... Yeah. You, we, people, I think, take a really interesting approach to Overwatch from my perspective. Because for me, this is basically all just a preseason. We're not even there yet. Like, nothing... This is not a real esports scene right now. We have very few lands. Everybody is just waiting for the Overwatch League and the actual big, big thing to come along, right? And, of course, we have a very good scene here in Korea. It's it's very helpful. Viewership is great for, on OGN. Um, the okay. Korean audience is... What? I, just, I like this. I, you've just gone full fucking Blizzard mode here, Monty. Like, essentially, if I interpret all that, like, you don't care about a lot of the right now like you don't care about online competitions in the west and no. just na teams moving around and I, but look, uh, by the way guys we, we do have og and apex in korea which is a fantastic <laughs> competition in many ways that does matter and uh, soon there will be the overwatch league then <laughs> it all begins I'm, okay. I'm just i'm just i'm just saying like remember how in league of legends there was champions before there was lcs right sure. the, it, um, in a lot of games that are popular the, the OGN will spin up a league before it actually occurs in the West. Um, and so I think that the professional scene has actually like started to get rolling in Korea, but we're still waiting for it in every other place. And even in Korea, we don't have you know SK Telecom or KT investing in teams yet, because guess what? They're also waiting on the Overwatch League because Blizzard has said that they're going to roll it out potentially worldwide, including a league in Korea. So everybody is just waiting right now it's we're yeah. just sitting around Which, waiting to see what the fuck is going to happen I, and i guess i mean i'm not going to say that that's not true i just think like when you put it into perspective of like oh is iddqd to rnrg a good pickup it's like does it matter like you know what i mean like at that point so yeah <laughs> that's okay how I, but like, here's that's the thing see, you know what I mean? So here's the question, though. As, a, as an actual individual player, ignoring every other factor, he was an amazing player, right? Yes. So if you I, put him on paper with those two players, we don't know the rest of the players publicly. No one knows the full roster. That's not the bad, well, there's three, bad there's starting three, there's three. Yeah, those No, three they've said yeah. Numlocked, Dummy, Seagull, and IDD Cutie. Yeah. Okay. So we need two more players, and now I guess there are rumors of Harblue going over there as potentially a flex player, which would make sense if the players that they have. 
Yeah, Grego also those would make sense. Those were the rumors. So if we okay, first and foremost, just just the the four that we know now. What do you think of that as a as a foursome as a four man lineup initially? It should be very strong. Like it should be a top. Like whoever they put in, as long as it's on a similar caliber of those four players, they should be able to contest for the best team in NA. Like barring the fact that NV isn't coming back or C9 is not coming back for a while, like they should just be able to win every single online tournament. What do you think, Monty? Uh, I think it's a good change. I, I I guess I have a much dimmer view of Clockwork than Flame does. I think that he's a massive... IDQD, at least in terms of skill, is a massive upgrade on Clockwork, given what we've seen. And I think IDQD, uh, we, we talked about him maybe not being the best teammate earlier, because had he been better on Fnatic, it's, it's very clear that Fnatic still needs a playmaker, and dropping him was, I think, from from the outside... Very silly of Fnatic, but from if he wasn't working very well in terms of personality with the rest of the team, then their actions make sense. So as long as uh, his skill can be there and perhaps his uh, less than stellar attitude cannot be, then perhaps it'll be a good a, a good uh, a good move. But purely from an on paper perspective, you really have to like the upgrade. Like as much as there's all the issues that these players themselves have had in their past teams and yeah we don't know the full lineup and yeah everything could go to shit in theory if it, like if if there's any success if there's anything there initially that surely that can overcome a lot of the political stuff you know like if you're a guy like seagull a guy like dummy you've been cr criticized for like the last six months super hard and now you've got id dqd and he's going off and you're winning games i, I feel like that sets a fantastic precedent going forwards you know you're going to be more I think I think the bond initially will help out in that sense. As yeah, long as the results are there, exactly, exactly. <laughs> as long as they're winning, and but if they don't win, like if they just keep, continue to lose, then suddenly it's like, well, well, what is going on? Plus, surely it's also worth it for ID, uh, for NRG rather, in as much as at this point. Like, if they'd have just kept that old lineup and tried to make one player move, who the fuck is going to take the poison chalice and join that team? Like. Like you could do it if you're maybe if you're a lesser player with a smaller name, yeah, maybe you do it then. But you're, like, who of the who of the talent level of IDQ would go and join that team now? Like, who the fuck's coming from Misfits or Rogo? No one, probably, right? So in no, that case, is it worth the gamble? You know, IDQD is objectively like the best free agent that's available for the kind of position and the kind of player that they need. If we're talking about hit scan dps players that have a lot of experience yeah you could take a risk on a younger player on a new player that has a lot of talent and upside or looks like they could be good someday but if you want an immediate upgrade somebody who's solid who has shown that they are very skilled and you go with iddqd there's not really another choice right now that i can think of off the top of my head who's anywhere near his caliber because i mean i get the idea that yeah who knows if it'll work out in the team and the dyna dynamics will be very fragile potentially with some of the, the players and who the coaches etc but to me this is like a scenario where it's like if you're a team who isn't winning and um, this is like 10 years ago obviously and you and like terrell owens will come to your team yeah if you're not winning then you might take the chance on that and just hope that he's gonna somehow work on your team you know because they're so good I guess the way I look at it too is if you think about it as follows, because we always we always have to think about what's going to be coming down the future when it comes to teams' decision making. So let's pretend for a moment that NRG is very interested in purchasing a franchise in the Overwatch League. Now we know that the Overwatch League is going to be coming quarter three of 2017, which is what six months from now, approximately, depending on when it actually launches. If your energy and you have a chance to sign IDDQD now. You can always go back and sign to your bench as a reserve player, an up-and-coming player later, right? But you want to lock this up before IDDQD goes anywhere else so that even if it doesn't work, okay, you just release him, you sell him off to a different team. But you don't want to just sit there and take a gamble right now when you can get a star-level player that you can always at least trade or, or deal off elsewhere later on. I think that's the better way to go. And if you if it turns out that he's not right for the team, then later on, you're just going to have a chance after, you know, look at the combine, look at up and coming players who are going to be less in demand. So I think you just take a risk right now by buying out his contract and paying him, you know, signing him for a year deal or whatever. And then you can you can just like make sure that you have him for the first season of Overwatch League in case you need him because he will go somewhere, obviously. So, OK, here's another piece of news, which is that Rogue 
is moving to Vegas to become a North American team. Now, obviously, like, congrats to North America. You've got a good team now. There's actually, like, the region's looking competitive. <laughs> all of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, they had NV4 totally, Monty. That, well, although they technically weren't over there the whole time, though. So here's the, here's the question. What, like, is this just a sign that Rogue thinks that NA is easy and it's just the easiest place to go right now to succeed and go to many tournaments and be local to NA and play all the I think, NA I think NA is a harder region because Envy exists in NA, right? And you actually have C9 and, and Fnatic are also in NA. There, I think the competition, we, we could segue this into you, later because there's been a lot of people getting mad about the European scene recently, which we can talk about. But um, I think that all it is is that it shows that the Rogue ownership really wants to be in Las Vegas what it shows is that they are very serious about making an Overwatch League bid for Las Vegas. They're clearly anticipating, like, they wouldn't be spending all this money and resources to move this French team, get all their players' visas, if they were not going to make a bid. I mean, I think that's what it shows. Like, Rogue will bid on Vegas. That's what this says more than anything else. And I think for, purely from a, as a, as a, po a former owner myself, it is so much more valuable to own a North American esports team than a European one. And people may be curious about why that is, and I've explained it before, but probably this audience doesn't really understand that. So the reason why is because sponsorship is significantly easier to acquire in North America because you're dealing with a, a country of 350 million people that has the same marketing budget. So you, for example, Nike has an American marketing budget that you might be able to get a sponsorship for for your team. But if you're based in Europe, there's a Nike Germany marketing budget and a Nike France marketing budget and a Nike Belgium marketing budget and a Nike Denmark marketing budget. So it's all carved up into these little, and so either you have to go through the nightmare of getting all these different offices to try and work together to give you the same amount of money that you could get in America, or you just take substantially less money. Like trying to get sponsors in Europe fucking sucks. It's the worst, okay? So it's much, much harder and you get less money. And there's also just a, like a smaller audience because of, Obviously, you know, even if you're broadcasting in English, you're dealing with countries like France where nobody speaks English. So you have to have a French broadcast and it's harder to get those numbers up. And like it's it's just it's really it's really much more complicated in Europe. So most most team owners would much rather own an American org. So then do you think that Overwatch will potentially become like like what happened in League of Legends, where okay, let's say the money's in NA, therefore NA signs foreign players, and that's that's the route there. Because if Europe, it looks like Europe has an abundance of talent in Overwatch, but if the, if the money isn't there and they want the big checks, do they go to NA orgs? Yeah, well, we know there's not going to be a a roster lock. Like you can have six European players on your NA team, you can have six Korean players on your NA team, so it's going to be a competition for those players and. Um, I mean, we don't know whether or not Overwatch League is going to launch in Europe this year or not. Um, but I think that a, a, like a large part of it is probably, realistically, NA is going to be the strongest region in Overwatch overall. Because the big owners that they want are going to pay for all Korean rosters to come to America. They're going to pay for all European rosters to come to America. And, and that even is though, speculation, right? You, you don't know that yes, some of them are interested in that necessarily? I mean, I think it is speculation, but oh, when wait, we... wait, whoa! Let me just see that again. Let me play that back over again. What was that? <laughs> what was that move? Look, his hesitation. He looked away. He thought he came back. Okay, right, back. no, it is speculation, but we know we know there's no. It's just it's very easy to see where this is going because we know there's no roster lock. We know there's no roster lock, and we know that really rich people are looking at this scene. So if you're if you're an NBA team and you want the best players and there's no roster lock and you come in later than everybody else and Envy already has Envy signed and they're bidding in, where do you go? Maybe you just go scoop up Lunatic High or LW Blue or something like that. Just pay pay that org a bunch of money, get those players on significantly higher contracts and bring them to NA. I don't really think that's far-fetched at all. See, I think that's a terrible plan because that costs so much money. You have to bring over people who don't speak English. You have to have translators. Here's what I would do instead, Monty. I would just, you know, like Hillary Clinton during the election, she had that uh, that network of people who went on the internet and they would just like start like uh, 
flame wars and they would just ruin all conversation, etc. This is actually proven, by the way. Like the, the, the DNC paid these people to essentially be like, I mean, this sounds so lame when I say it like this, but like digital agent provocateurs. Like, there's not you nothing professional cool about trolls. That. Basically, yeah. But I mean, are you mad that they were like taking away from your job a little bit? No, because the thing is, I do it for the love. I do it for the love of the game. So <laughs> you troll for the love exactly, of the exactly, game. Exactly. Exactly. So, <laughs> so yeah. Here's the thing. What I would do is I would spend all that NA money. And I would actually just have loads and loads of Korean fangirls. I'd basically have them all over Kakao. I'd be messaging every <laughs> Korean player. I'd be starting romantic relationships. And then what I would do is all of my sleeper cells would awaken on an instant, which is when the Overwatch League is announced. And I would take all those bitches down. You'd just see it. <laughs> Could be like free fall and then with the scene with every, when, when all the dust is cleared i would come forwards with my european team and then i would kick ass in the na and european only league so that's, that's how right. i'm gonna Thor, make the Thor west great again for yes esports honey entrapment make the west great again <laughs> <laughs> See, so, and at this rate, the Korean players are gonna have nowhere else to go. But then they, they exactly. keep up. <laughs> so okay, this is actually a real topic I want to talk about because obviously it, this was a massive piece of news, which is that Lunatic High. Okay, so the, the, here's the genius, you know. And you know, everyone used to joke, and if if a, everyone predicted a move was going to happen on like League of Legends on Reddit, and then it happened, they'd be like, "Yeah, we did it, Reddit." Like as though they as though they were the reason it happened, right? <laughs> Obviously, it never was. But in a mad way, it's like the fans are taking it on themselves because you know these Korean teams will, except for um, Luxury Watch, the Korean teams will not make the right lineups. Like they insist on keeping these lineups together that aren't quite as good as they could be. So it's like the it's like the girls of Korea have actually taken it upon themselves they're so selfless that they are going to craft this scene they're going to be the gms of these teams so that somehow okay they've made this they've this is all drama come up and we can get, as a sidebar apparently it's still questionable as to whether some of that stuff was even real and apparently some of it might have just been someone acting yeah. out of spite etc so that's a whole clusterfuck in itself and so lita jun and dean essentially were the guys who retired like literally did commit sudoku like <laughs> and then just just move move aside and so here's the thing flame here's the weird question okay did it didn't this actually potentially make them tick high better that's the part i didn't understand <laughs> when it happened it's like who, who set these attacks up like wait a minute they made it better what do you think of this i mean Everyone was asking for Tajin to go in season one. I don't think anyone's too upset about him leaving. I mean, obviously I'm the circumstances not. were. I mean, obviously the circumstances were less than ideal. But from a fan standpoint, you can't be mad. Like yeah. they're obviously going to perform better. I think. I, I think Dean, more so Dean's like, hard to say though. Yeah, I agree. Dean is harder to say because Miro isn't at his level of Reinhardt play, but yet, but obviously, you know, Miro is a much better Winston player. So. You know, maybe he'll be better at Reinhardt eventually. But I think what was so funny about Lunatic High was that they were just bending over backwards to like fit Taejun into the roster. And it's like sometimes Jay Hong would be playing Diva and Dean would be playing fucking like Ana and shit like that. And they just kept switching their hero pools and switching their roles just so that they would be like basically cover for Taejun's weaknesses. Meanwhile, Who Are You is fucking crushing it now. And he, him and Eska, I think, are a significantly stronger combination for DPS. So, yes. I mean, I think it sucks that they were entrapped. And it sounds like Lee Taejun may have just been, it may have been entirely false or some shit like that now. Who even knows? I think it's really fucked up. Um, I, I, I The Korean fans are super harsh about that kind of stuff and i don't really agree with the way that they treat the players especially when we talk about you know uh like lw blue players and i don't think it's fair even if ilbe that website is an awful piece of shit i think it's not really cool to hold visiting that website against players when they were like four years ago when they were in their early teens like i just don't think that that's something that you should uh you know beat people over the head with Unless you have evidence that they were doing it very recently, etc. I mean, the, the whole thing on both counts of what you just said is just like some sort of mad social thought police bullshit. Where yes, like, you you cannot say oh, do this. It's like, like I, obviously, I realize we're not exactly the most authoritarian bunch. So obviously, we're just like, I can do what the fuck I want, bitch. Like, yeah, <laughs> which no Korean, like no Korean's going to come out with a statement saying that money. I realize. See, if here's another thing, Monty. If I was a PR agent. 
and I was working in Korea, probably wouldn't have a very long career. Like, <laughs> I'd come out with that. I'd, I'd come out hard. That's the thing, Monty. My, one of the problems I've had in life, actually, is there are times I understand I've crossed the line, you know, probably upset really? someone, you know. But here's the problem. I think you all that in my brain. No, 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 wait. You no, actually this understand is the problem. that concept? This, that this sometimes exactly you may problem. have crossed the line? I'm actually impressed. That this no, is obviously, something that obviously I've never really crossed the line. But I know that people think I've crossed the line. And so <laughs> there we go. Okay, that's got effectively got the, the same thing. It's effectively <laughs> the same thing, right, in this, in this world. So the problem I have, Monty, is that the, my first thoughts in my mind are, oh, they think, square brackets, I have crossed the line. And then I think to myself, <laughs> Crossing the line obviously has probably upset people. Like it would be very easy to just apologize or just to say like, you know, like, oh, it's a misunderstanding. But then the problem is before I've, this is all like before I've even spoken, it's like inception, you know, like one second lasts like a hundred years. And then the next thought is like, but then who are these people to judge me though? No one could judge me. Only God can judge me. There is no God. Therefore, only I can judge myself. I choose not to judge myself harshly. And therefore, I will have to actually go on the attack since these people can't judge me and <laughs> stake a bold, bold claim so that then if I'm a pushback at all, I'm still really ahead of where I was before. So that's you know, the approach that I would take. You know what? You know what my favorite thing about you is, Thorne? Yeah. So your thought process goes like this. You say something that other people find offensive yeah. and then you're like, people get mad. And then you, for some reason, you think to yourself, you know what's going to make these people not bad anymore? What if I write an epic treatise about the context behind what I said that I know the people who are mad on the internet are never going to read? That will show them, ha, ha, ha. No, that's what I learned. That, <laughs> see, here's Mon Monty. That was actually the moment when I thought that I could reason with people. I thought, you know what? Put it all you out really there. Thought they were gonna read I, thought, I thought I'll put it out there. Anyone who wants to actually know the facts, you know? And then what I realized is, again, now I've come to that conclusion. I've, I've been enlightened by actually realizing that you should never actually care what people think. So now I go the other way and I go, I don't have to justify anything I say. And so to go, come back to the original point, that's where I wish Korea was a culture where one of these players, like it's okay if one of them, like the Lita Jung guy, he can just fuck off. Like, yeah, okay, he cries and like leaves the scene. That's fine. Uh, but if the other guy had just come out and said, you know what? Yeah, you know what? I was talking to those girls. You know who else I was talking to? Your mother. She's on the couch. <laughs> if someone had come out like that, I would have loved them even more. I'd now support that guy for life. He's a baller. Also, I, I did say this at the time. Like, when I first saw that story, like a lot of you, I thought, well, if they had to step down, holy shit, what was going on? Like, were they just dating, like, you know, four or five girls? Was this just, like, the equivalent of I mean, like, Tinder? It does sound like Tinder? Dean was actually doing that, right? And he was, like, okay. mess sexually messaging underage girls and shit. So that one may be a little bit more serious, you know? Uh, you know, there's moral gray area. It depends on what country you're in and, and what time of human history and stuff. So, who am I? again, who are we to judge him, Monty? He is but a man. No, but the thing is, I can't believe the part where the Lita Jung guy, it was just implied that, like, it was just girls he was talking to just literally chatting shit over the internet like like i, I just want westerners to really think about that for a second your Does whole career is over because you were trying to talk shit to girls I, <laughs> do, do you realize that think about that that's the end of the world in society for you imagine living like that in a society doesn't bear thinking about it would be absolutely ridiculous also that's it's a bit like, you know, there's that movement in America at the moment, Monty, where they want some feminists, it's obviously never going to happen. Some feminists want it to be that if you lie to a woman in a bar and you tell her, like, you know, oh, I'm a businessman or a rock star or something, and then she sleeps with you, that if she finds out after the fact that you're not, then that <laughs> should be, like, declared some form of, like, rape or something. And I literally what? just said, when, when, I, when I heard this, I said, listen, obviously I understand it's, it's maybe not nice that someone would tell you that, but you are aware you are about to destroy all of Western civilization. Like if you take <laughs> the ability to lie away from men that I'm pretty sure like population just drops to zero. Like you're not going to have any increase. Are you? It's going to be like Japan times a hundred. You're going to have no, you're going to have no children being born. Like if what we all have to come up and go, I'm a loser. I live at home with my parents and I have no degree. Nope. You don't sleep me. Ah, oh, shit. Oh, well that, I was honest. You got to give me that. I was honest. So yeah, no, that was my thing when it first happened. So when I heard that, I, that's also to tie back into this point before Monty, why I am certain that these Korean players will go to NA. Because what happens is, here's my other job I could do, Monty. I could sell all these Koreans. So you know, at the moment, the problem in like League of Legends is the best Korean players, even in the years 
when you didn't make as much playing in Korea as you would have in NA, they also wouldn't have left because, for example, you know, like they had deep entrenched relationships with organizations and coaches and they all wanted to play as a unit, for example, which you couldn't do in League of Legends in the West, obviously, like a five-man unit. And then on top of that, some of them wouldn't have been comfortable with the culture. That's where I would have come in. So in, Le in Overwatch, I would come in, I'd be the sales rep, you know. I'm like one of those guys in the 80s who was like from US and UK selling like arms to the Middle East. Like, yeah, look, you want this new rocket launcher and shit? Like, this, look, this attack copter, you can kill all the all your neighbors with it. Like, I'm that guy who's selling that <laughs> shit like that, you know, like a pro Tony Stark or something. So I come, into, I come into Korea and I'd tell them, listen, the first place I'm going, I'm like, listen, packages are all very good you know like they're, they're willing to offer you fantastic circumstances all the eagles you want uh, you, what do you say uh, uh packages are really you know the salary is really good the house is really good talk to all the bitches you want online w what do you mean though <laughs> yeah oh you haven't heard about american culture let me teach you something and i'd pull out like i'd like graphs and fucking and have like diagrams and i'd have little educational videos in america you can talk shit to all the women you want with no <laughs> consequences and then <laughs> twitter yeah, that's how I would get all of them, and then they'd be like, "Where do I sign up?" We're like, coming yes. back. We're coming back to the old summiting exactly. inside of you know, exactly pizza and dollar bills. And I'd be like, "Listen, flower, <laughs> I've talked mad shit to so many women, you wouldn't even realize it. So I get away with it all. So you come to you come to you come to the USA, you forget about this life in Korea, and we'll have a utopia." You can I tell my my utopia is you just to be allowed to talk shit to anyone I want to. You can 4chan and read 4chan <laughs> without actually, you know, everybody losing their shit. You can even, well, actually, I guess you can't post Pepe's. So there are there are still limitations. <laughs> we live in our own prison, Monty. There are, we live in our own prison, mate. Like, there's, there's, still, there's still a lot of consequences that are unintentional to the internet. But for now, no. Actually, if there's any fans out there who are good with art, I want someone to make a, a Pepe that looks like Monty. <laughs> so make make one of those and have him in like a little like that thin black tie that he always wears i mean it's unfortunate monty that you have been compared to hitler in a lot of your pictures because of that haircut <laughs> that you had like that the connection i've just realized i've made there that's getting that's tenuous that's <laughs> you're not many you're not many steps away there and many <laughs> okay moving on so <laughs> what do you actually think of what this will do to Lunatic High then, because obviously like they've been doing better than the old Monty expected in OGN Apex, right? I mean, yes. Hold on, I have to let my cat in. Flame could answer about Lunatic okay. High. So, okay, Flame, yeah, basically, mean, the premise mm -hmm. was when we did the preview for this with Dummy, Monty thought that Group B would be like Luxury Watch Blue, you know, first place, clearly. And then he thought second place would be contested between Lunatic High and Misfits. And he had Misfits, like, taking it in the end. But obviously, at the moment, it's going fantastic for Lunatic High. Well, I mean, if you put Dean and Lee Tejan back on the roster against Luxury Watch, they might lose. So that kind of goes back to the fact, like maybe them losing those players is why they're better now, or like it left them in a better s situation. I mean, I don't know what you think, but I actually, Lunatic High was the team the whole time in Korea where I looked at it and I was like, this team has some really good players, but it has some massive glaring <laughs> holes. And I'm just waiting for them to make the roster move. And essentially, like they've gradually made some moves, but they've never made like the whole overhaul I wanted. You know, this is one of those teams where I would have chopped it in half, put it with half of another team, you know, and I, I think it would have been way better. Yeah, I mean, that's what, what was it? Did they, they lost to Rogue last year, right? Or last season? I remember watching the match where like Lee Tajian just could not hit a far out of the sky to like save his life. It was like a King's Row match between Tavik and I think it was Tajian, but like that was when I realized like they need to get rid of this guy. I don't know if Monty remembers or knows what I'm referencing. Uh with with Rogue? It was Rogue when Tavik and Reinforcer still on the team and there was like a I King's Row match. Lunatic High was in Envy's group last time and they beat Envy. Was it playoffs or something? Uh, no, I don't remember. Watching? Uh, Rogue, Rogue got eliminated. Was it IEM Gyeonggi you were watching? Maybe it was IEM. I don't remember. I just remember watching I mean, Lee Tejan. Yeah, I just remember watching Lee Tejan be unable to kill Tavix Farah and being like, okay, like I don't understand what's going on here. But my point being, going back that I mean, we're saying fits, that like... This fits after, that was the one with Tavik, uh and the Swedish roster. They did play Lunatic High in the quarterfinals of IEM Gyeonggi, but they got 3 0 by Lunatic High. They lost every map. Maybe he Stop. means that APEC, APAC 
final where it was like Lunatic Kai against. Yes, 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 yes. You're right. Actually, the one where they played yes. Rogue in the final. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. That was in China. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it was that tournament. But back to the point of losing Lee Taejun and Dean probably gave them better chances of beating Luxury Watch last week. So. Was yeah, it really I also they also did replace a significant amount of their roster because remember Zumba came in right so he was on Conbox and he joined the team and then who are you joined the team so they replaced but one third of their roster coming into this event and I also think that they've been helped out massively by the patch too uh, they they their dive compositions their aggressive style is really helped out uh, by this patch the fact that they have a an extremely competent Genji player now is really helpful on this patch so they're they're looking quite good and I think they were pretty convincing against LW Blue as well. Yeah, that was a lot more one sided than I thought. They're just good though. Like I, that match was weird. I think I watched. I think I analyzed that. But I remember reading up on. I don't remember which forum it was. It was a Korean forum, and they were like talking about my video. And I just remember thinking, like they were like they were saying like, oh yeah, he's right. I don't know why this guy stayed on Diva the entire match. Like that was the match I think where they got ran over on Gibraltar. Like luxury watch just got like plowed in like four minutes or something. Yeah. To a dive comp and like. But it's probably patch centric. Like Zumba can just one trick Zarya for the entire season, and it's never going to stop. And who are you on the Genji can just play that whenever he wants. And then if you yeah. have the best Winston in the game, like obviously all the cards are in your favor at that point. So yeah, they're so definitely. So is Lunatic scary. High suddenly a contender? For sure. I mean, I think if we take yeah. if we take a look at the contenders for this tournament right now, the teams that we would say are going to be the best. You look at both Kongdu teams. You look at Lunatic High, you look at LW Blue, Envy, Misfits, and I'm still not entirely sold on Meta Athena, but I think you have to look at them as maybe the lowest of the favorites, but that should be the, the most powerful teams um, in the tournament. Yeah, I'm not sold on Group A at all, I guess. I mean, like watching that BK Stars match, I don't know if BK Stars just got infinitely better this season. I remember last season just being like super disappointed with them. But then they 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 arguably could have beaten Envy, and Envy arguably could have lost 3-0 their first match too. Like what it was like Kings Row match, they like lost by like one or two sound barriers to, or they yeah they won Kings Row, but if they lost Kings Row, it would have been a three-zero. So, Envy's not looking good right now, like particularly good. And Meta Athena and BK Stars are like almost beating them. So does that make them better? Does that make Envy worse? I don't. Do you know. think the patch has affected Envy's success? Oh, yeah, yes. Envy's really rocky right now. They're having a hard time. I mean, dive like dive compositions are just getting way better, and they don't have traces. Like they don't have a top tier tracer. Like they don't have a top tier Genji, and their Winston player is now playing Lucio. So I don't. <laughs> so where do they go from that? Uh, they either figure out a way to counter it with just their raw teamwork and aiming ability, or they lose. I mean, I don't see them making it to the finals of this. Apex. Okay, what do you think, Monty? Where's Envy at? So they tr what's interesting about their last match against BK Stars is on the first point Village on Nepal, they tried to swap all their roles and like Coco was fucking playing D.Va and you know, they were doing really weird shit um, that was surprising and they lost that point and they didn't really look comfortable switching up their hero pools and then they just started going back to like triple tank and soldier, basically. And I think the last patch was great because Harry Hook could just play Reaper or Soldier 24-7 and Mickey could just play D.Va. And Mickey could play Zarya very well too, but I, I just don't think they have the right mix of players. And it got really scary for Envy in that match because they had to fall back sort of on Taimu's individual skill. Like if Taimu hadn't been fucking beasting everybody on Widowmaker, I think they would have lost. Like especially on Dorado, it, he was winning some really clutch duels that he... You shouldn't win again as a Widowmaker against a Tracer and a Genji, but he was because he's he's insanely talented. But that was the, the it was like these little one v ones or these little out skills that were actually helping them win that map because they weren't winning it because I think they were playing the meta in a particularly good way. It was incredibly risky on King's Row, and if again if they hadn't switched to that Widowmaker and surprised them, like I do think the tactics that they used were good, like the. The way they adapted on the fly uh, was good, but it's just they were really just scraping by, I think, and that that could have been a really scary match for them. And BK Stars, we watched them get pretty much crushed by Meta Athena. Uh, 
I don't think BK Stars is that much better now. I think Envy is struggling. Yeah, they could they could have easily been out of the group already. Like they they were maybe like three or four team fights away from being out of Group A already, just based on how the Meta Athena match went in the first week, and then that BK Stars match. Like it could have they could have argued, MVP, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, MVP. They could have gone either way, and that's not good if you're them. I guess like obviously it's not good, but I don't know if it gets better now. But you see how they're winning matches. Like their teamwork is just better. Like you see that flashbang hook combo on Dorado. Like you're never going to see that again from yeah. any team for another like six months, maybe when someone's like, "Oh, I can do this." But they have they don't have like a shot caller, like a really strong shot caller, and you see that now. It's like getting highlighted by the fact their ults aren't even really that good. I, I think it was what was it? Well, Skya. They were just like bombing ults left and right, like completely unnecessarily, and that's not going to fly against I think like even the Kongdu teams right now, who weren't super strong last season, but now they look incredible. See, the interesting thing was, though, actually, there's a VOD, you can see it on Reddit now, where Tai Mu did his own analysis of their match <laughs> against BK Stars. And in it, he essentially says that, like, they don't ever go back and watch any of the games, like, even the Apex games. And in the actual VOD itself, he, he like, he actually, there was a comment later where he revealed that actually he's the in-game leader now and he like shot calls a load of the stuff. And even the way he describes this, this is like another PR nightmare, right? Like this is all great stuff. Cause you know, when people are like, we just want transparency. Yeah, but you want transparency to find out what's going on and it to be things you want to hear. You don't want transparency. If, like imagine if you said to someone, oh, I want everyone in this room to be transparent. And then this old man who's in the corner mopping just goes, I'm thinking about that girl's tits. You go, well, <laughs> don't, don't say that. Like, come on, man. Like, like, oh, what, what do you mean, I mean transparency now? That's the problem, though. So in this, in the Reddit post, Monty, he even explains that, like he already said, you know, someone else already mentioned the part where, you know, he said that they don't ever t spend time watching the games. But he also explains that, you know, even though he's the full-time shot caller and he does all that stuff, he calls everything. He calls the hero comps, switches, the pushes, the macro plays. He says, but he doesn't always do that in scrims, though, because, you know, it can be quite tiring shot calling for six hours a day. So he just, you know, he just switch. Yeah, if he's having a good day, he, he calls in scrims. Otherwise, he just, you know, just plays scrims. So what what is the mentality to improving here? That they don't go back and watch even the match, the important match they just played, and then in scrims they just sounds almost like they just free for all in it half the time, or they're just playing a, like how how do you improve with this approach apart, apart from having amazing players? That's the problem, I guess. Right, like they've been stomping for so long, they have really really talented players on every position, like until this meta, I guess, because uh, arguably right now, there's no obvious counter to dive compositions that they've figured out that they can play. Um, they might have some plans for the playoffs because I know that they're getting rolled by Lunatic High right now in scrims. Obviously they can scrim because they're not in the same group, but yeah. I, as someone who's shot called and played DPS at the same time, it's, it's really, really hard to like maintain that throughout an entire afternoon of scrims, which is more or less why you see the Lucios doing it for most teams right now. So like have expecting your DPS to be like focusing on his positioning, his aim, sitting on the crosshair, like worrying about the Genji flanks, you know, like stuff like that. And then also does my Lucio have ult? Should I be worrying about this Graviton that maybe my Zarya has? Like there's so many little things in this game that it's putting it all on him is not going to work out in the long run. Like he's going to get burnt. So I think that time is just catching up to them and like their experience is starting to come crashing down. I guess it's like that CSGO example, right? Like that Nip team that was super strong. Was it Nip? I, I'm not a big game? CSGO. Yeah. At the beginning of the game, yeah, they just won everything, and then suddenly time caught up. I think that that's where Envy's at. Yeah. I mean, isn't it going to be very difficult, especially if you're like the hit scan player and the star player to be the shot caller as well? Like, imagine that. You lift some of the shit they pull off anyway in the game just individually is mad. Like, like the just how quickly they can do stuff. What? And he's going to be talking while doing exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, I disagree with that. I don't disagree with his statement that he can't just... It is exhausting to shot call six hours a day. It's, it's exhausting for any player, and I think that's primarily a coaching problem where you have to have the scrims where you go ham, you have to have the scrims where you're, you know, your coach says, okay, we're going to take a step back, take this one a little easier, we're going to focus on um, maybe not shot calling, but uh, expanding our hero pools for this scrim, and everybody just focus on playing your individual hero as opposed to really trying to get that coordination down. So I think there are ways that you can, uh, the coach or the manager can really make sure that you're not overworking your players because trying to play every scrim like you're in a 
uh, professional match really does burn you out way too fast. It's not a smart way to practice, right? I am disturbed, about very disturbed, that they are not reviewing the film of their own games because I think there's a lot of value there, obviously, to take a look. And a player who makes a mistake can talk to the rest of his team and say, hey, this is what I was thinking at this time. This is why I used that ultimate there. Um, so we need to fix this problem because you did this thing that maybe used my ult and uh, we just need to figure out how that's going to be smoothed out in the future. So I am I find that quite alarming, actually. But they've never, but they weren't losing, right? They haven't lost. That's like that's where, not an excuse, I'm not saying, man. I'm not excusing it. I'm just saying discipline. like, that's their mentality is like, we haven't been losing. So it's going to catch up. But they have a coach now. So maybe things will change. I mean, okay, they're so, going to have to. So, Flame, in that case, I have to ask you this question. So before, we were talking more abstractly about the concept of, like, if the whether you should make roster moves or whether you could use coaching to improve the team. So we asked this question on a past show, so I want to get your take on it. Is it not a huge flaw going forwards that – a patch can so radically shift. I mean, it just it shifts almost every team. You either get way better or way worse, it seems, at the moment. And with the, uh, with some of the drastic patch changes, is that not going to be a problem going forwards? Because, I mean, it's one thing if you have... You can have the best team in the world. Everything's running great. You've got a great communication. But then the patch nerfs a hero that one guy plays and then buffs something that you don't have a counter to. I mean, at best, how are you going to beat the team where they've got all those things as their strength, you know? isn't it, isn't it, It's always, always going to be tough in this game, right? I mean, I played a lot of Dota and like a lot of Dota and TF2. And like in my eyes, you should be able to be versatile enough as time goes on to play everything. I don't think like if you have players in Dota like RTZ, like if they're you can't ban out RTZ, you know, like you can't ban out some players in Dota. Like if you took out five heroes in the draft, they'll still have one that they're super proficient in. And I think that that's where Overwatch has to go. I think to Monty's point about the scrims is the issue is like every team is treating scrims like this do or die championship final because the NA teams are so toxic that they're like, oh my God, we beat FaZe in scrims. Like obviously we're the better team, but then they get to MLG Vegas and they just get dumpstered. But like teams are actually like talking shit based off their scrim results in NA. And like, that's a real thing. Like you laugh, but it's a real thing. And that's, it's like this mentality of like all these teams are going into scrims saying like, I can't play May. What if we lose to FaZe in this okay. six o'clock block? You know, so <laughs> it's the players. It's I've, and I've had this conversation with Siegel. It's like a mixture of the players being bad and the players not practicing correctly. Like you should have a Lucio that can play Genji. I think that that's a completely valid idea. Okay. And like, yeah. just be able to swap between them. Like I think the solution for Envious might be put Harry Hook back on Lucio, let Hulk play Winston maybe in a match and see how that goes with Mickey Zarya. Because Harry's not going to play a good Winston, so like, what do you do? It's either you expand your hero pools or you lose. And I think that there's even pub players with deeper hero pools than some of these like pros right now. So they're going to have to get better. Right. The only way we can get all these NA players out of this habit that Flames just described, Monty, is we need a real... It needs to be a big, short, sharp shock to the system, right? So what we're going to do is at the next big event, I'm going to hold an awards show, right? And I'm going to invite up on stage. I'm going to be like, come on up, Cloud9. And they'll come up, oh, well, what were we doing here? And I'll go and awarding them with the check for 50,000 scrim dollars is, and then this girl will come out, da, 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 da. she'll come out with a check. And then as I'm about to hand it over, I, I like have an earpiece in. Wait, wait a second, what's happening with it? There's... There was not. Oh, there was no money to be won there. Oh, the, uh, my apologies. Turns out you win nothing for scrims, and then then they have to go away in shame, probably in disgust. And then actually, I the, I you know like the applause sign in American Studios TV. I have one that just says "Boo these men," and then that that actually <laughs> the lights go off, and then everyone boos them, and then they look. Well, I mean they're probably used to being booed off stage at this point in time. But aside from that, so this is the this is the floor go forwards though, is. Why do, why do NA teams always have that mentality, right? Because I've noticed another thing about that flame that I've noticed is it's nearly always the teams that never shut the fuck up about the scrims are the ones that, well, I mean, I'm just going to use them as an example, would be like an NRG, which I, I, I'm not saying I know that, by the way, behind the scenes, but I mean like a team where on paper they should be better than they are, but they're not really getting the full results. And so what they'll what they'll do is in conversation, they'll always be like, no, nah, but we were beating that team in scrims or like, you know, oh, we got, we got a game off that's a really good team. And like, that's their way in there 
their mind of sort of either denying the reality that they're not as good as they think they are or kind of justifying, you know, the existence of the team or a player staying in the team. Like, I, I, I agree. I think that's like a massive flaw going forwards in the scene if you're going to have people who think that way because obviously the goal one day is for scrims potentially in terms of the result to mean nothing and it just to do about what you've worked on in the scrim, you know. But are we going anywhere with that? Is that even a solution? I mean, like the first week when I was on, when or like the first couple months when I was playing with Splice, it was like we should find a team to just run the first point of King's Row like a hundred times with. And just get really good at pushing King's Row first and then like take the game from there, you know? But I don't even I don't think that that's happening right now. And like that was our approach at the beginning. I mean, the team fell apart for different reasons, but I'm not sure that that was everyone's mentality. And I don't like we used to keep a spreadsheet of like, oh, maybe we should swap to these heroes on these points because they have X strengths and Y weaknesses. But like I don't think that that's happening across the board. And I don't even know that like, and some teams just get overwhelmed by it. Cause like, you'll have players that are so used to winning, like, and that's the Overwatch team right now, right? There's a bunch of ex pros from other games. Yeah. You have like the Quake winners, like they're not used to losing. You have like the TF2 players who had no competition. They're not used to losing. So like they take scrims again, like way too seriously. And I mean, imagine that Monty. So like one of the best Quake players of all time, Rafa, you know, like he's like, oh, I'm, I'm not used to you losing. Welcome to Team Liquid. Can you imagine? Can, <laughs> can you imagine the, sh the sheer, the arrogance of it, the hubris? Oh my God! Okay. Well. Hey, hey! At least their CS:GO so, team made major final. That's like the high point. <coughs> team Liquid. Uh, they did, Monty, but they were literally carried by the, who will probably be the best player of all time at the end of CS:GO from Europe. So it's kind of a little asterisk next to that one. <laughs> so we'll just pop that little asterisk on there. They they don't want to, by the way. They did. They don't call themselves Team Liquid Asterisk. I call them Team Liquid Asterisk. So. Okay, so here's the question going forwards then. When you describe that scenario there of how teams practice and their mentality to practice, are there some of the Western teams that actually have more structure? I don't, I don't think so, no. Like, like none. And that's, that, that, actually, that, that's that was, that was my worrying. point at the beginning of this was with yeah. NRG. Like, they have the infrastructure. Like, they're obviously willing to pay for it, but they're not using it well or, like, to the greatest extent that they could be. And that's, think about that's some like of those games, sad. right? So think about some of those games earlier, like the ones you were talking about, even AP APAC, Premier, Final, etc., where, like, Tavik would pull out some amazing just solo play that would win the game out of nowhere. Like, you can't really plan for that, though, can you? That's like some NFL team being like, well, we're not going to work, you know, listen, we're not going to run any drills. We're not going to have a lot of offensive coordination. What we're going to do is just, just fuck around. Like, we, I'm a good player. You're a good player. And then if, if things get rough, I'll just throw like, you know, 60 yard Hail Mary. You, maybe you catch it with the game. Like, that wouldn't be a plan, would it? Like, that, that has to be the well, fallback out of nowhere. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the game that was, <coughs> is or was more around hero switching, I think, back then. Like, you wanted to be able to say, like, okay, they're running May Reaper Zarya, we should go Farah. And you'll see teams, even right now, just never pick up Farah. Even against May Reaper Zarya or May Hog Zarya, whatever whatever it is, they just won't go Farah because someone on their team, just they just can't do it. Like, they're just not confident in it enough to run it. And it's like an obvious hero choice, but if the player can't play it, then they're going to lose. And I think that that's something even like mb right now like you can just abuse the fact that they can't run a genji and like run heroes that would otherwise fall to it or even Farah. so it's i mean it's just the, how the scene is right now i don't know how to fix it i don't know how to get coaches to start taking the game differently like right now there's such a lull in tournaments that i don't even know what the scrims are like right now like what are teams even playing for they don't have coaches like it's a mess <laughs> Well, the ones that aren't in Korea, at least, right? Yeah, exactly. uh, obviously, especially now that winter premiere is over, and uh, yeah, it is. It is interesting. We'll see. It seems like the only tournament that's going to be available for Western teams is a three v three tournament for whatever reason, right? There's a carbon thing that just got announced, which is only sixteen oh, to right. eight. Yeah, and, and then I think like Razor just announced something. Tournament. Yeah, it's another online thing. Yeah, there's no lands for sure, and that's another. Okay. <laughs> Thing. So, Monty, you, you just referenced the Overwatch Winter Premiere there. Now, it was a past show where you in, almost disdainfully spoke about it, like, you know, oh, who cares about, like, it's just all online results and stuff. 
Mate, even on LAN, like, that just looked like someone put all the names in a hat and, like, they couldn't actually hold the finals and they just put, picked the names out and they were like, oh, turns out you won. Yeah, like, what <laughs> What even are those results? Like, where are I mean, all the good really, teams? Yeah. It was really disappointing for me because, uh, first off, when, when we look at Immortals, like, they didn't even get to go with the, like, they didn't even get to go with their best player. What, Nami? Yeah, wasn't right. even there. He's a Mexican citizen, so he couldn't actually go. Um, and on the online portion, he was the player that I think was impressing me the most. Obviously, like Grim Reality was doing really well too in the finals, but they basically just sort of walked over their opponents, even though they didn't even have you know a great Reinhardt player like Nami there. So that tournament was like I don't want to say a disaster, but it was it was a disaster. Like. Every team was mid roster swaps. You had too easy getting kicked from phase like that. He beat them. He beat Cole. Cole made it to that land, I think. Yeah. And the they only reason the why they made it there was because or they almost lost. They almost got out. But like phase beat them. Actually, they would have had a higher seed with too easy. Then they cut too easy. And then liquid was swapping out ID. So like suddenly liquid's not winning games. Phase isn't winning games. And they're like, obviously, the favorites going into this because they just came out second place at MLG. And then you have Liquid, who like didn't have a great showing, but you expect Liquid to start beating these Tier 2 NA teams. And then you have RNG, like the Renegades roster, who has great results. They're like 5-0 and or something, top of the tournament bracket, and then they cut their Zarya player mid-tournament to swap out <laughs> for Kib. For Kib. So yeah. then they lose like seven games in a row. They don't even make it to the land finals. Like... The tournament was just a disaster from a spectator point of view. Like you had to follow the rosters, you had to follow the really, really like bizarro bracket where they had a round of eight, which turned into a round of six, which picked out a top four, which went to a LAN, which was best of like no lower bracket, just like one best of five or whatever. Uh, it was it was so hard. Like it just wasn't good to be a part of or just to watch. Obviously, a bunch of the big name teams didn't even qualify for the offline portion. To what extent is like well, a lot of them qualified, or you know, a lot of the teams like left to come to Korea. You know, yeah. they qualified, and then they were just like, "No, peace out. We're going to Korea now." How? What kind of uh, correlation do you think there is between online, Overwatch, and offline? Like compared to other games you've followed in the past or anything like, like how how drastic is the difference in terms of the like upsets you can have and results? I mean, fucking Shadowbird's playing from Russia, like. Yeah, I mean, phase on MLG. <laughs> phase at MLG was like a Cinderella story almost, and it was like super fun to watch. I thought like that was one of the best. Like every series that they played, their Fnatic series, it was them versus Fnatic. Was probably like the best series of the year, I think, from a spectator point of view. I mean, obviously sure. I was there, so maybe I'm biased, but it was really good to watch. So when you have this cross continental roster stuff going on well, like obviously. international i mean you uh, on yeah. these online events the point is is that you have all these european and american players playing together on the same team and like the ping is fucking unreal like you that people criticize phase for having poor online results but a lot of the reason is because of the huge amounts of ping that these guys have i mean i i just I, it's really hard for me to take online results seriously obviously shadow burn should have just played sombra and just hacked the whole <laughs> game outcome and then I mean, that worked for complexity for a while. They just kept crashing every server. But even like they're figured out to the point where now their best player wants to quit or is leaving. So it's just very raw. It's just a rocky NA scene right now. I don't really know how else to describe it or like you can't really justify it either. It's just how it is. So what do you think the, the foundation of that is? Just that teams aren't doing well enough? Um. I mean, every team has like their honeymoon phase, and there's a lot of really conflicting personalities. There's obviously okay. like accusations going around on like on multiple rosters right now. It's then there's like, like a like lot of tournaments. That, 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 that's a great analogy, by the way. Like, I've always thought honeymoon phase is a very good one, you know, for when you first join and things are going great, etc. I mean, I realize you guys are all from America, but you know, it, like not every relationship after the honeymoon immediately ends in divorce. You know, you can also then just have a not quite as good as the honeymoon, but still satisfactory life in which yes. you stay together for many years. <laughs> like, like why, why, why is it all going to shit? Why can't everyone just keep a team for like four months or something? Well, because you back to the original point of the meta ruining a team's results. Sure. So you win for a patch, and then suddenly you're losing. You're like, oh, we have to change something. 
Like you know what I'm, they need, Monty. I've realised. I've just solved it all, mate. What they need to do, Blizzard are so ahead of it, Monty, because what they're going to do is since the patch is going to ruin everything, every time there's a new patch, they're definitely going to do a draft of all the players onto different teams again so that you have a chance to pick <laughs> players that play. I've done it. They've, you, Monty, you did a good job trying to like delay everyone from finding out the truth, <laughs> but that's actually genius. Whoever thought that up at Blizzard Esports, it's not that your game is a bit busted. It's that you've, you've solved it. You just had to redesign the entire esports scene. That was, I mean, so like, obviously Monty has been like anti-draft or whatever, like they can't do a draft, all this stuff. And that, He's more against the draft than those fuckers in the 60s, mate. No, no, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean I'm just saying like, from a from a player perspective, it might be like better for as an org to like say, yeah, I'm just going to release all these rosters and just start picking up players. I mean, formally as a draft, not going to happen. But yeah. in terms of just like, I'll just release everyone. We can make a better roster than this. Like, it's well, gonna, it might come down to that. Sure. Here's the thing that might happen. Again, and I talk about this in this video that I made about the speculation about the Overwatch League, that people can't seem to get it through their heads. Even the pro players that I talk to are like, buddy, do you know if there's going to be a draft? I'm like, no, there's not going to be a draft. Like, calm the fuck down. You don't have a players union. It is illegal in America to have a draft without having the players union because there has to be, it's considered a monopoly by the owners at that point, right? There's nothing to bargain uh, against the the league owners or the team owners, mm -hmm. so it's it's a monopoly. It's an antitrust issue, and so you have to have a players union. Now, obviously, there is not going to be a players union at this point in time because nobody's doing anything to set one up. Will there be a draft in the future? Maybe two or three years from now, sure, maybe, but not now. And what I speculated on in this video is that okay, so what happens if a team gets, you know, a, a team doesn't decide uh, an existing team let's say envy doesn't decide to buy into the overwatch league they or their bid is denied for any reason now the players are still going to have agency in this where if all envy's six players want to continue playing together they can simply go to the teams that are in the league somebody who doesn't have a roster who bought in and say hey you take all six of us or you take none of us and then that person will buy out the contracts but i think what's actually going to happen is that instead of a draft there's going to be a massive free agency pool right they're going to do the combine all these players will be uh introduced into a free agency pool the players that are currently contracted but if their teams don't buy in uh they will be released you know somebody's going to pay for their buyouts whether that's blizzard or a team owner a new team owner who knows but there's going to be a big free agency pool and then uh, teams will be able to assemble from there. Now, that's very interesting, right? Because players can go to each other at that point, and um, maybe maybe Taimu decides that he wants to play with Shadowburn, and they can go to orgs and say, okay, we, we want to be on a team together. And there will be negotiating power for the players, mm -hmm. is what I'm saying, in that situation. So I don't really think you have to worry. And even if it, players can stay together, it won't break up existing teams, or players will have leverage to create new teams that they would like to be on. Um, so it's not just going to be a draft where you, the players have no say in what's going on. That's not going to happen. Yeah, agreed. I think that the the fundamental thing, back to what Duncan was saying, though, about the patches, it's like right now you have your two DPS players, you have your, you have your healer, you have your off tank, and then you have your Reinhardt, and you have your Lucio. And like maybe there's a patch where lucio and reinhardt are just dead maybe they up the move speed of all the heroes in the game maybe she maybe earth shatter is way worse and you don't even need a reinhardt like players are bad right now i guess is how you have to look at it and like one tricking a little too much in their scrims and then their future is not as secure as the people who are out there like the tivix and like the time moves who are like very very great at like three or four heroes and that's where it starts to get a little dicey when you're a player on a team and it's like, oh, we're going to go into this Overwatch League and we're only going to have the best eight-man roster. Like, well, maybe it's very easy for a Genji player to learn Lucio. And that's where things start getting a little hazy, I guess, from the six-man rosters of today. Well, I also think that it's a typical pro player reaction when we talk about how you like to say the patch or the meta is going to define things and that it, the patch and the meta makes all these rosters change but frankly i think it's a very pro player attitude to say oh well this patch we need to change all our players like they don't actually solve the problems or try and improve they're just like well better exactly. to change all our yeah, players exactly. now and so that's going to be a skill that will be valuable once the overwatch league actually starts is that you're not going to have 
the opportunity to do that and you're actually going to have to you know try and practice new heroes and get better at them instead of just throwing out your projectile dps player because two hit scan is stronger right or start picking up an eight man roster (laughs) well that's also the short term for real real, obviously Yeah. yeah Yeah, but I mean, the flaw with even that part is even if you did have the eight-man roster, if it really is like one hero is not being used, what that guy then is then going to sit on the bench for two months? Like, it's hard to see logistically how you'll manage that. You know, the whole point of a real roster in sports is, you know, that guy can come in for part of a game, you know, or every well, other but that's game. Well, so, you know? that's so, look, it, I actually think that the game is, you know, doing pretty well in terms of balance, particularly on this patch. Like, you can run double hit scan if you want. You can run hit scan projectile. Um, there's this patch in particular, I think, is quite good. And so, I would like to see eight man rosters just so that you could have different strategies for different maps, right? Uh, maybe you have your yeah. Winston player come in for your Gibraltar map. And I don't want yeah, to see some guy idea. on the bench for two months. I want sure. to see it like, I want to see teams have that flexibility on every single map to be able to retool their roster and have those specialties. I mean, that would be good if they really were like, you know, the guy who just does one thing and you have him for one mode, you know, where it's very very popular to still use that hero, but maybe not on the others or something. I would like to see that be like blind though. Imagine like you're going against Luna Takai and saying like, oh, you know, Miro's coming in. Maybe we should just get our best Reaper player out here. Like, you know, you can start getting into some weird mind games with your player preferences against each other. I don't know how that's going to how that would work at the end of the day, but it's it, the players just have to start playing more and playing practicing more efficiently. It's like you have all, even like the ladder. I mean, ranked is its own mess depending on how you look at it, but like you have people who are so cocky, like they'll just play their one hero, they'll get to 4400, 4300 as like a Genji only or a Winston only. But they'll never take the time to learn May or McCree because they're just not confident in their aim and they don't want to lose their rank. So it's even like the ladder is not really helping them in that sense. It's it's the player's mentality right now because I think everyone's in like this weird shark tank where they feel like they have to kill each other to survive, which is true. I mean, Overwatch League is only going to have X amount of slots, right? So you better be the best at whatever you're the best at. And right now people are focusing on SR and is it healthy? Probably not. Well, I think that's a that's a bit short sighted too, because I think a lot of these teams are going to be looking at not only picking up a six man starting roster, but picking up development players as well. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if each of these teams had two or three players that uh, are sort of just there to improve over time as potential upgrades in the long term. And, you know, for for. If Blizzard gets what they want and they sell to very these very wealthy traditional sports owners, it's really it really is not a lot of money for them to keep a couple of extra guys on salary in a team facility. So why not just do that and make sure that you're strong for the long haul? Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not disagreeing with that. I'm just saying more or less people are going to start looking at those ladder ranks more, right? Like if you're even Blizzard was saying like, oh, ladder heroes or whatever phrase they used on that Overwatch League site where they describe like the top players on the ladder as the <laughs> yes. number one draft picks in the combine or whatever, like number one free agents in the combine. It's like it makes the players focus on their small hero pools because that's the best way to climb. You know, uh, it's it's like the problems are accentuating the problem or like making the problems worse <laughs> in you would some hope, way though that no one who's actually going to take players to their team is going to use that metric though like but <laughs> sir he, he was number four on the ladder ah tell me more then well, what about this guy over here it's a mega player Nah, it wasn't that high on the ladder i think we we're going to go against him couldn't compete but what are you going to base it off of like there's no stats i don't i don't know like it's hard to make you probably you know, just pay people who yeah, seems to I mean, know a lot about esports yeah. games, paying lots and lots of money. Uh, J- Stephen Page to talk to him initially. Uh, I'm available. I'll, I'll, hmm. I'll, I'll talk. I'll, I'll say things. And then not hold those people accountable in any way for any of the things that they say. Again, the theme in general of my life and all utopian futures is that people should never be held accountable for anything they say. Okay, Monty? We all can agree upon that, right? See, that's actually, that really is my utopia, you know. I, in that sense, I'm very realistic 
while being a very optimistic person, Monty, which is my utopia isn't that we live in a paradise where everyone is wonderful to each other and we all live in harmony. It's that we live in a world quite like this one, but you can talk as much shit as you want if you're me, and then you get away with it. So that's the, <laughs> that's the plan going forward. That's I'm, I'm pretty utopia. sure you already live in that reality. I do in a way, but I don't. All, the key thing is I don't always get away with it. I, I think 100%. I think really, I think really the terrifying thing that this shows me about you is that this must mean that you are holding back in some way because that's you feel persecuted. Thing, right? You yeah. feel persecuted about your ability not to have the oh, ultimate in free speech. This is the this is the one. The, here's the, I'll, I'll I'll admit to you, Monty. The one thing that tilts me when people talk shit about me online. Okay, it's not that they talk shit or they say I'm rubbish or idiot. I don't care about any of that stuff. Right? That doesn't matter to me at all. But I do get tilted when people make out that like. I purposely say something outrageous to get people's sticks. It's like, it's the other way around. Like, I actually have to tone myself down to be on these shows. <laughs> That's how fucking based I am. Like, if I just walk in the room, it's like, you guys would all die of too much <laughs> leetness. I don't know. What would the what would the HGH equivalent be for someone who's talking shit on the internet as a gamer? Hit, yeah, baseness. So that's the problem. I always say this, like, people don't know that I... There's so many times in CSGO, right, where when we're in the green room, one of the people like Anders or something will be like, haha, we should film the green room. I'm like, are you fucking kidding? No. Like, <laughs> the amount of shit that's going on in here, like, you you have to censor it all. <laughs> are, you, are you an idiot? Like, you couldn't put this shit out? Like, it'd be the end of our careers. The amount, the amount of stuff that we're all saying in there. And also, then you'd see that you, if you're not watching the game 100% of the time. So definitely don't put out any footage from a green room at any point. <laughs> like, imagine if there was some amazing play, and then you saw that the analyst was, like, opening a sprite in the corner or something. wasn't even looking at the screen. Like, that would also be the end of all credibility, right? But you know what? You have to open a sprite sooner or later. Well, I mean, I purposely, I personally hold that there should be a person there. Like, I, I, I sort of like a slave who just gets the sprite for me and opens it, Sarah. But you know what? Some of these events won't provide slaves, personal slaves, Monty. I mean, you don't. I don't have, know what the world's you don't come have, to. Uh, production assistants to get you sprites. What's wrong with you? We do, but the problem is, you have to have like personal relationships and know their names and know to call them in. And I don't keep track of any of their names, so unless they're in the room, I've got to get my own sprite. I'm afraid. I can why go. Who's just, that guy why don't you with just the? Snap your fingers and say I over here. I try. I just go. Who's? Where, did that? Is that guy coming back? The fat guy with the hair, and then they're like, I don't know who you're referring to? Because America, obviously. And I go, ah, well, I'll just get it myself. And I get get it out of the fridge. <laughs> See, I'm still I'm still one of the people, Monty. I haven't got that out of control as a diva. I still get my own sprites. Don't even like Sprite. I don't know why I picked that as. That's how <laughs> nonpartisan I am. I don't even drink Sprite, but I picked that as the one because no one drinks Sprite, do they? It tastes like lemonade. Like, what the fuck <laughs> even is that drink? Can't even believe that's a popular drink. It has no flavor. It just tastes like weak <laughs> lemonade. Who, do you drink Sprite? No, no one does. No one does. <laughs> oh, actually, wrong. I'm wrong. Koreans drink Sprite because they have that garbage that's called cider. Chill Sung Chill, Cider, yes. yeah. That is like a rubbish version of Sprite, but that's how weak the Korean soda game is, that they think Sprite is actually legit, <laughs> and they even have it in bars to go with soju. It's so garbage. So they, don't, they can't talk to girls online, Sorry, they can't drink you soda. You are literally a man who drinks grape soda and soju together. Yeah, I've I seen you I do this on multiple occasions. Yeah. Are yeah, you really exactly. going to be elitist about Sprite right now? You, you Listen, Your palate is basically a dumpster fire. If you drink grape soda and soju, then you can actually legitimately, in an entirely unironic manner, say that you got crunk. <laughs> All right, that ends the segment of the show about drinks that I use as, as mixes. So, okay. In OG and Apex, the two Kong Do teams are doing pretty well so far. And Monty's is that how now, we're gonna, That's the transition you're going to go with? That's the segue. So, because they remember they're Koreans, they drink Sprite. Well, a sort of a Sprite that they call cider, which isn't really cider. That's the segue. So, the two Kong and Uncia teams both doing quite well. Admittedly, one of them is in that group that's not super good, Group D, where it's just Fnatic, basically. But what are your thoughts on the two Kong Do teams at the moment? I love them, man. I think they've been doing really well. I've been super impressed by their play. Um, I think when we it, they they have surprised me both in their like basically their dominance. Um, we look at Kong Duoncia. They took out African Blue last season's finalist, which we could argue probably shouldn't have been a finalist in a world where the brackets weren't as shit as they were. Uh, three to one. 
But Kongdu Panthera, even after Runaway was looking quite strong, basically just put them in the dumpster. Like their coordination and especially their their ult management on both of these teams has been exceptional so far. I am incredibly impressed that they have been able to communicate so efficiently with each other that they know, for example, okay, we only have these this one ult available, so we're gonna do a like a long flank around on King's Row to get the tack visor in position to basically maximize the value of that ult. Um, damn, it's it's their coordination is <coughs> pretty amazing right now. What do you Panther, think? Of, I, I mean, Panther is scary. Like they're they dumpstered Fnatic. Like it wasn't even like a close match. It was like a straight. <laughs> like they put them in the trash, and I don't know where Fnatic goes from there. Do you think Fnatic's gonna make it out of the group? Do you think they're gonna beat Runaway, or is it Runaway? Uh, who's yeah, there? Like, yeah, yes. it is Runaway. Runaway is there, like. Do or die. So, maybe I don't know. It's I, I think uh, it's hard to tell. I think I think with Fnatic when we saw them play against Kongdu Panthera, they were, I mean, they had so many problems. Like they couldn't fucking kill Rascal. Rascal just basically went off on them on Farah, and that's been my continuous complaint about Fnatic, has been that they don't have that star player who's going to make like the big plays to win them a game. Is their teamwork very good? Yes, it is. Is that enough in Korea when there are? A dozen teams that have pretty decent teamwork uh, to get, put them over the top. And when they had IDD Cutie, they had that guy who was going to get kill three people and win the round for you, right? Um, you know, I get so triggered have... every time you say that because every time you say they don't have that star player, I always just like run that clip in my br brain where it was at the Overwatch Open and Huck's like, it's Buds, 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 Buds is the best player, Buds is the star player. <laughs> <laughs> and what's funny about that, that Buds had like the worst showing he's ever had against that Panthera in that match. I like. Yeah. I don't want to pin it all on him, but he had he had zero impact in that Panthera match. I mean, they were like switching to heroes that could kill the fucking Farah, and Farah is just like, like he was just like one v sixing. Rascal was just like one yeah. v sixing their entire team. It was impressive, but at the same time, it's kind of sad from Fnatic's angle that that was able to happen. Well, they've always well, been the like they're like meta slaves. They like they're like the definition of like the meta slave team. Like they come out with the Reaper. Beyblade strat, that was like their only thing that got them through whatever tournament that I think that was like the Overwatch Open. They made it pretty far just running Beyblade. They made it decently far at MLG just running Quad Tank, because that was obviously meta. And then the week after a patch, they don't know what the meta is, and then they just get absolutely handled. They never well, really diversified. The patch, though, right? When they played against Kong Dude, like their first match against this, uh, or their first match on this new patch is going to be in a couple of days when they play against Flashlux. Now, Flashlux should be easy because I think Flashlux is, in fact, the worst team in this entire tournament. So if they lose that, it's going to be super sad, but yeah, I don't yeah. think they... No. And then the question is, Runaway, who 3-0'd Flashlux but got 0-3 just like Fnatic did by Kongdu Panthera, what does that match look like? And I think Fnatic's going to gonna have their work cut out for them. I think it's like a 50-50 on that one who wins. Yeah, Runaway's a very good individual talent, I think. I mean, they have like players that will make big plays, but right. it goes back it goes back to them putting like Cool Mad on Zarya. That he was like one of the best DPS players in the game in beta. I mean, obviously that was a long time ago and you can talk about how that doesn't matter, but like he was known as one of the best McCrees, but now he's like their best player on Zarya. I don't know. I, I wasn't I'm not really impressed. I mean, Happy was good at Diva and his I think he's a Genji player too, but I know Happy from TF2. I don't know what his skills are like off that diva player or off that diva hero. So, what do you actually think of the the team in terms of like what Monty was saying? Do, like, do they have enough star talent? They're probably the like none of them really ever have bad showings. They're like consistently good together. They're, but like I would put them. In, I think that they're like a level up above Liquid, but they're essentially the same as Liquid, where nobody ever really steps up. They just kind of get by, but. They have better individual talent in that regard. I, I mean, I think their problem, like they really do as a team, I've spent some time with them here in Korea, you know, st uh, sat in on some of their scrims. And what I will say is that out of the teams that I've seen in Korea, they have a, a significant, they probably have the best discipline and they're constantly communicating with each other about uh, strategies and they have, you know, pretty complex like team composition ideas and strategies and um, they're much more organized about how they think and strategize about the games than the other than any other team that I've seen in Korea so far, which is kind of pathetic, frankly, uh, that nobody else has been able. I, like I'm not going to say exactly what they do because obviously that'd be a breach of trust, but I will say that 
their level of organization would be considered bare minimum for a League of Legends team. And like, I don't even think anybody, obviously it's a new game, not the same infrastructure, but it is kind of sad to see how little discipline a lot of the other Western teams have had out here. So Fnatic definitely, considering their coach, Raffle Gator, isn't even in Korea right now, they hold themselves to a pretty high standard and they do a lot of the nitty gritty work that I don't see a lot of the other teams doing, which I think is reflected in their play. They do they do react to strategies very well, right? Their their conception of the game is good. It's just, again, we go back to it. It's like you can have a great concept of the game and you could know what you should play, but if you don't have that guy who's going to go fucking ham on people and, and pick up the kills, then you're going to have some issues. Yeah, they're, they're like a stand-up group. I don't think that there's a more stand-up group of players in the scene at all right now in terms of just like PR from a PR standpoint, from like uh, just getting to know them standpoint, like I know most of them pretty well. They're just like they're just they're just nice dudes. I don't know how else to put it. And, and they I they think, I think they really shows. treat each other well. Yeah, um, they're very they're mature. very respectful people. And they were again, they were the first team to pick up a coach. Because I mean, isn't the concern for that team that like if you have all these positives going for you, like you've just outlined here, they don't win. I mean, in most tournaments, you know, they do well. They but have they, great but they games. Do, I mean, they, they, they placed top four at, at Vegas, sure. right? They could have easily made the finals. <clears throat> it went down to the wire against FaZe. Uh, but they did have what we could argue in Group D is a relatively easy group. Obviously, Kongdu Panthera, uh, we expected to be good. We didn't expect to be this good but th because okay. they made roster changes and we didn't know what to think. And Runaway uh, did better in the qualifiers than we expected as well. But you'd still think that there's a pretty good shot that Fnatic gets out of this group, right? It's not sure, like... When I, mean yeah. this when I mean win, I mean like sad. actually win tournaments and be the best team, you know? I don't think anybody had that opinion that that was going to happen with Fnatic, right? I don't know. There, there are tons of teams throughout, sports teams throughout history where you see that a team can get by with a lot of good strategy and a lot of role players and without a star player, but it's very rare that in sports a team will win a championship without having a star player, right? Can you think of any, Duncan? Well, there was one, basically. It, like, in the NBA in 2004, the Pistons won, when, in theory, they didn't have, like... Uh, pretty sure they didn't have, like, a top-five player in the in the NBA, probably not even a top-ten player. You know, they had, like, what... But they kind of, like, cheated almost in a sense because instead they had, like, five starters who were all, like, you know, reasonably pretty good, like like semi the best at their role, you know, like like a top 10 player at their role. So in a way, they almost like spread it out in that sense, you know, and it goes out right. and it, it worth pointing out they only won one title, you know, so it's not like they were the dominant era or something, but that was obviously a massive anomaly. No, I, I agree also because 13 years ago, it hasn't yeah. happened since, right? It's just, it's very unusual in team games, especially team games that only have five or six players. Like we're not talking about yeah. American football where you have, dozens of players on your roster right where you can yeah. sort of it's much more about that teamwork um because the more people you have the harder it is to have a breakout performance um no but but when this you is have, kind of the point when I'm you making. have like basketball where you know there there's a very small number of people on the court at any any given time it does make a lot of difference and when we're talking about team esports you don't have 20 plus people on the field at any time you have you know 10 or 12. But that's kind of the point I'm making, though. Like, actually, the worst place to be in in most of the sports you're talking about is to have that sort of a team where you... Like, it's usually what happens is it's it's where you're the team where, like, you're between superstars, you know, you haven't decided who's going to be the franchise player next. You've maybe got some, like, really good up-and-coming players doing well, and then you've signed, like, a couple of veterans who, like, you know, you kind of... You know the limit of what they're going to do, but they're good now. And so on paper, you've got a good team and you win games, but every... You know that you're just going to make it, like, you know, a round or two into the playoffs, and then you're going to lose, basically. Basically, because I what's mean, going to happen is you're going to face a really good team who also has like the best play. You know, who's going right. to take over the That's, game. I, I remember. I remember. I guess my example of this. I, I'm not a big basketball fan, but in basketball, what I what I recall happening is being from Colorado. Uh, obviously, it was a big deal when uh, the Nuggets traded Carmelo Anthony to the Knicks. Yeah, and the thing is, example, is that. Yeah. It, it actually made the Nuggets a better team because they got some role players on the team and they would make playoffs, but they would never make very deep playoff runs. But they no, literally like didn't have a star. <clears throat> 
No, the funny thing is, Monty, that's actually a very good example because that Nuggets team for the next couple of years yep. was very deep. What they did is because they got because when you trade a superstar, unless you get another superstar, you tend to get a lot of pieces. You know, they got a lot of players who were all like very serviceable or like you know underratedly good, and so it meant that in the you know the regular season, you win a bunch of games, you get the playoffs, and people are like. And by the way, you you always get the the coach always gets mega credit when a team like that does well. The problem is though, there's a reason why like all the greatest players in history you know usually have like championships and stuff it's because eventually you do need someone who either can just do yeah. something no one else can do in the game or who can do like the the clutch moment for you or something like that and if you look in overwatch if you think of almost any of the big championships you immediately just think of like some dps player doing some amazing sequence or someone doing some super clutch play that turned the whole game around like it, it's it's kind of hard to just look and go no they just had a really great team play and won the game ha huh? Three cheers for friendship, and let's all continue on as friends. Well, let's let's talk about why why this is particularly in Overwatch too that you sort of need this, and I think it comes for me it comes down to the fact that ultimates are so powerful in this game, and the way that ult economy works is that you know we can talk about whether this is a is a good or a bad thing, but it's it's been interesting because I've been watching you know a bunch of League of Legends um, again recently, and the snowball in League of Legends is actually like super bad where. I guess like from now from casting Overwatch and then having some perspective on it from another game, it's really hard in League. If you start to fall behind by like 5k gold, it's so hard to come back. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous because there isn't a way to reverse that snowball. Like in Counter-Strike, you have, you know, if you lose a bunch of rounds in a row, you get more money so that there's like a there's like an anti-snowball mechanic yeah. in the game. Um, and in, in a way, in Overwatch 2, there's also an anti-snowball mechanic in that you get ult charge. Right, no matter what you do, whether you're hitting the shots or not. And yes, ult charge has a big effect, but basically at any given point in any given Overwatch team, each team will have their own opportunity to have a, an ult economy advantage that they can use to um, make an aggressive play or to win a fight, even if they're the less skilled team, right? In theory, you the, the ult power overcomes perhaps that, that smaller amount of skill. So what you really do need in Overwatch is you could have the best ult economy management in the game, but you're still going to be on your back foot sometimes. And sometimes you need that player who, when you don't have the right number of ults, and we saw this with Envy, so when they were defending on King's Row and they were defending in the Foundry and they blew all their ults and then they switched to Widowmaker because they know at that point in time that BK Stars is going to have an ult advantage and they need to moderate that somehow, right? They know if they switch and they get a pick, they can slow down, maybe force them to blow some ults and then punish them for that, right? And it, you really need some guy who's going to fight back and make some incredible plays when you're at an ult disadvantage. And I think that's like one of the most important kinds of players you can have in Overwatch because okay. you have to have that guy who can, you know, it's easy for Lucio to press Q. It's hard for that McCree player or let's say, you know, that Zarya player to know exactly when to counter it with a Graviton Surge and where to position and where to go in to neutralize that advantage. So for me, when I watch Overwatch, like, I think about that a lot. I guess, I mean, I watch, I, I'm, I've never been, like, a big league spectator, but from a Dota perspective, I find that the alts economy in Overwatch makes team fights a little too, I mean, this is a separate topic, but too predictable do you like do you find that when you're casting and i think that that's my biggest gripe with the game currently but i, um, I guess back to your point about star players though i think that you're 100 percent correct like back like when misfits won overwatch open like soon had like the greatest tracer performance of anyone's life <laughs> arguably and you do need that player that can just get that pick on the ana and stop the nano boost from ever coming out or cancel the high noon with a headshot or something like that but I guess I disagree that I think it's too predictable. And the reason why I say that is I probably would have agreed with you a few months ago. But now that I see, I think teams, I think part of that was that teams were just not very good yet. I think that it, what I love about new esports is you really get to see how the game develops. And I think that watching this season of Apex and watching teams like the Kongdu teams or, like I said, Envy play, I think that teams are figuring out how to make hero swaps and make positioning choices and flanks that are making ults less impactful, right? Because it's all about getting the, the highest value out of your ultimate or forcing the enemy to blow something uh, and waste it in a specific way. And I think from, uh, uh, like I could go back to that King's Row example from Envy, or we could talk about, you know, the way the Kongdu teams are pulling off flanks 
uh, when they have they're at an old disadvantage and still winning these fights. I think it's becoming less predictable as teams learn how to play around it. Right? We're seeing. As time goes on, we're seeing less and less like death balls, just like six six players smashing to six players. And we're seeing significantly uh, more coordinated and tactical approaches where, you know, two guys will be flanking out on the side and then they're going to, you know, get a pincer movement. And then, you know, the four other guys are going to move in at the same time. So it's the strategy is really becoming a lot deeper. Um, yeah, I'm, I guess my disadvantage. I've been watching a lot of NA, which is the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess so. Maybe maybe I'm biased in that regard. Yeah, you're right though. I mean, it's it's just I guess my my thinking when I watch, it's like, oh, this team has graviton, nano boost, blah blah blah. Like, if they do this, then we're gonna get this result. As opposed to like someone like after watching Dota, you're like, I don't really know what's gonna happen in this team fight because there's no real correct order of operations. I guess in a team fight, I mean, there is, but it's a lot more. I love diverse. It's reactive, right? Yeah, I mean, there's like ability. There's items. You have like six items at any given time. You have four abilities as opposed to just like four abilities. Yeah. So, and when the alts are so much stronger than the abilities in this game, whereas that's not really true in MOBAs, I guess it's a little different. I guess in my, is, it's just worse in my eyes. But I, don't know. I actually think, in a way, though, it's one of the things I actually like about competitive Overwatch is that it makes it so that. The, there, there isn't there isn't a snowball in the same sense like the floor in league of legends i mean i've always said this, this is one of the reasons why i really hate that people uh rank players based on if their team wins and if they lose in league of legends because that game is so deceptive in that sense like yeah. you can't be the best top laner if you're, you're in like the ninth best team in your region you could be doing all the stuff inside the computer that would mean you'd be the best but there's no real metric that can show it and in fact even what people see with their eyes will look like you're not very good because think about your cons the whole pro problem with league as a game is because you literally gain levels and items which are just stats you're literally getting bet. So it's like you win a fight and then you come back and you're stronger than me. And then you win another fight. It's like at that yeah. point in time, you know, like that's the that is the main is, problem. Is, is, like it's content, you know. Yeah, and I've I have railed against this for a long time. And you're a Dota fan, so you know that a lot of Dota items are not stat based, but they have actives, right? So you get more actives. You basically get more abilities the more money you have. In League of Legends, like almost all of the items are just fucking stat sticks. So it's like I. I could be, you know, an AD carry player, and just because I have another item than you, like I'm just going to dumpster you like nine times out of ten. Like it's, it, the snowball is actually crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, as opposed to I guess Dota, where a blink dagger can just completely negate an entire ultimate or five alts at the same time. You know, but you have to. But there's like a skill to using it, right? Yeah, exa there's, exactly. There's exactly. not, and, and I, like I love League, obviously, and I, I cast it for many years, but it's just. I just been doing more thinking about games in comparison recently. You know, having switched over to Overwatch and going back and watching League, and you know, I, I realized that that's something that I really enjoy about watching Overwatch and CS:GO is that the snowball is just—it's nowhere near as severe. And I don't—I don't know very much about Dota, but uh, the snowball is nowhere near as severe as in as in LoL, where I mean, you literally look at a lot of stats of these games, and it's like if you have. You know, a 3K gold lead, a 3,000 gold lead at 20 minutes. Sometimes teams, like overall, if you look at every single team, it'll be like an 80% win rate. Yeah. I mean, that's. Well, that's the point, though, as well. I, even I pulled that number out of my ass, but it has been that number in the past. I don't know what it is right now. There's even like a unique aspect of watching that sense, though, because the thing I like about CSGO, but, and this is a benefit for CSGO in itself, is that not only is there an anti snowball mechanic, but it's more like it's. It's not like it just. It's not like Mario Kart. Okay? You don't just get a chance to suddenly come in the lead because you were the last. Okay, no. It's more <laughs> like you just keep resetting the ta the the playing field. And so the key right. thing is, I always like here's the, a, a very contentious point. Okay, that not many people in CS:GO agree with me on. I actually hate it when people go on and on about momentum because I think a lot of people think momentum is an actual thing, a tangible thing. Whereas to me, it's just a psychological process. And so if you're someone who isn't affected by it, which is what you find with a lot of the best teams of all time, yeah, okay, so you win three or four rounds in a row, but then my economy, you know, the economy resets, I have money again. If I'm a really amazing team we start even again i can now win every single round in theory it doesn't matter that you won four before it doesn't help you win the fifth round so the the key point here is that is an extreme version of like an anti-snowball mechanic but what i like about the overwatch one is that you saw in the first sort of like four or five months of the game being properly out and having competition is that you'd have these teams where they were really really good teams and they were really skilled and when they got like early on they made some great plays and they got advantages and they were they were scoring 
then they would just go way too ham into the next play immediately, like as if there was a snowball aspect, and they were like, oh, just run over them. And it's like, well, no, once teams learn how to be more disciplined with their ults, when they have the ults, you can't just run right in them. You're going to get smashed if you do that, you know. That will immediately nullify your advantage in that sense. You know, you actually have to make each play correctly in theory. Yes, exactly. And you see it more as in, you know, I've been I've said this over and over and over again, but I see it as more of an American football style. It, the more time goes on, the more it's going to be running plays, right? You're going to you you come to a point, you have a composition, you're going to run the play on that point. If the play doesn't work, everybody just chucks themselves off the map and they you reset. And that's why there are people complain that Overwatch is just a big mess, but actually the more refined the game gets, you're going to attack, you're going to either be successful or you're going to fail, and then you're going to reset. You know, you'll have 15 seconds where everybody's coming back, trying to, to do another play, trying for a long flank or something. So actually the game has slowed down a lot. The more, first off, increasing ult charge time was wonderful. Really appreciate that change, For first off. And second off, the more the more skilled teams get at coordination, the longer the setups have been, uh, the more uh, decisive they've been about when something's not working, they'll just kill themselves immediately and then try for another you know, push. So I think that the longer this game goes on, uh, the more of that you're going to see. I also think that I'd still like to see another 25% added to the old timers, but with the caveat that that really won't work on control maps, so here's, uh, just because like obviously you win one of those fights on a control map and you could just snowball the rest of the game. It's pretty snowbally as it is. Uh, control is probably the you know is is pretty damn snowbally it when is it comes the to those. Old. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, people like to talk about snowball on assault the two CP, but I actually think it's less snowbally right now than control. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I guess. The way the ults work, I think, like adversely affects the modes in some ways. Like when you look at payload, back to your point about like you eventually get the ults back. Like you look at a map like King's Row, you can get dumpstered on like the first two points of King's Row in like three minutes, and then like put together a six minute hold on last. Like that's not really yep. far fetched or impossible. Sure. Um, and like I guess like that's good to watch. And I think it, like a lot of even in like pubs, players are like, oh my god, we're getting destroyed. Like what went wrong? But like in reality, it's like your Reinhardt died first. Suddenly, like the game's over from at least for the next two minutes or three minutes because yours has such a massive disadvantage. And then like you look at control maps, I think that the lack of, or I guess Koth, whatever it's called, like control, um, the fact that I think. I think one of the things that TF2 did right was it gave defenders higher respawn rates. Like if you controlled the point, if you died, your respawn timer was higher than the team that was like trying to retake it. So that, like this way, trades on offense were a little bit more valuable as opposed to like, oh, I'm just like, if you, look at, idea. if you like look at Li Zhang, right? Like you get hooked into the pit, like that happens, right? Like you'll be in night mode, yeah. whatever, garden or whatever map it is. You get hooked into the pit and you're like, all right, this is over. But imagine like if you trade with that Roadhog, it's not really advantageous for you at all. Even though you have like the worst positioning, you don't have control of the bridge, you can't really come through that little white room door. It's like I think that that's one of the things that needs to be addressed or changed. I think I think I honestly think that spawn timers are like one of the biggest problems with the game right now, just across all modes, in terms okay, of so just like not helping. What, are, what about this then? Should there be different spawns spawn timers based on mode? Yes, because I don't like the idea of how the game is right now, where. Back, back to your point about how alts are like, decreased. That inadvertently made defense stronger, which is why you see a lot of teams, even on payload, not being able to close out maps like Dorado or maps like Gibraltar. Like They just can't ever get up that hill because more or less like the spawn times are equal. So the team at last always has the better spawn because they spawn right at the end of the point. And like you wind up in this weird spot where you have to team wipe to cap, but since the spawns are super short or like 10 seconds and they have a shorter walk than like the fact that you can't get ults faster to clear them out becomes like bad, I guess, for the offenders. I, I think that like you need to adjust spawn rates. Like if, I think I would fix, I think you could fix the game pretty quickly actually. Okay, I, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. I mean, I, I like I said, I, I really want to see another 25% increase to ult charge timers to make the game sort of less... Uh, this is take, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting idea that you have to, uh, to make things a little bit less chaotic. And ult spawn timers could really help that on control, even if the, the ult timers were changed. Because my thing is, I want there to be fewer ults still. 
Um, and so if you're going to have fewer ults, you have to make sure that control is not going to be a snowball fest, which your ult, your respawn timer things could help with, right? If you're, if you're going to be the team that's defending who's currently capped, then having longer respawn timers does eliminate some of that threat. I think another way to do it is to make control a best of three and increase the amount of time it takes to get to 100%, which would mean that at least there would be some sort of comeback. You wouldn't. It wouldn't just be a giant snowball based on ults. There'd be a time for the ult economy to sort of reset and come back in. But I like your idea maybe a little bit better. Um, I didn't know that about TF2. So um, that's definitely that's definitely an interesting concept that I would like to see. But I think if you know Blizzard said they're working on more game modes, and I don't really see a problem. The ult economy stuff. If you increased ult timers by twenty five percent, I don't think it affects payload that much, even as it is right now. Because those tend to be longer. I mean, it would affect it a little bit, but not to the same degree that it would affect control, right? It's it's like a mix, I think, in my head. Because I don't know so much that ults are the problem in terms of time as much as it is strength. Like, I don't know that I mind pulse bonding Look, I, I, decently. I, I just care because I think... I mean, you can tailor each individual ultimate, um, but I think that it's better for a viewing experience to have ults more rarely. Yes, but I think to that point, back to the offense versus defense thing, I think you, again, need to change spawns to make that better. I think like, so I've been playing around with custom modes. Like we can go talk about how they added these custom modes to the PTR or whatever. I think it's like the greatest patch that this game's ever had and probably will ever have. But if you start playing around with like damage values and like alt charge rates, you start realizing that like, you have to team wipe to win maps and like win points. Like you need to get six kills. And when everyone's trickling in with 10 second respawn timers, it gets really difficult without these massive team fight ults. So like that goes, I think I honestly want respawn waves where like you spawn at the same time. Like if you die, you're at 19 seconds. Maybe someone dies three seconds later. So they're at 16 seconds. And all five of you will respawn at the same time. That might solve this problem. But the whole trickling thing is never going to go away. And if you start taking away ults from offense, like then the trickling just keeps going forever and ever. And I like back to the spawn times, I think is like my biggest problem fundamentally. I, I agree with what you're saying in the ults being decreased, but you have to realize like you need that Earth Shatter Graviton High Noon to finish out King's right. Row. For so, sure. Yes. And that's like where it gets dicey. Okay. So when you, I'm just curious. So when you say, so I'm, I'm excited about the custom mode games because. It took, what, seven years for League of Legends to implement a sandbox mode, and that was absolutely ridiculous, obviously, because your Flash was on, like, a five-minute cooldown, and if you wanted to practice Flash as a pro player, you just had to sit there and, like, Flash once every five minutes, which is absurd. So I'm excited about it from a pro player perspective because it's going to allow you to set cooldowns to very low to practice whatever rocket jumping a soldier, you know, every few seconds and, um, or, or stuff like that. But what do you, what do you like about it? Um, I mean, I guess the way Jeff, I don't, it seems like they kicked it into overdrive, I think, the past month, at least from a development standpoint. Like, they've been messing around with the Roadhog hooks, they've been messing around, they gave us this, like, sandbox mode, and I think that they're starting to look at more feedback from the professional scene, but I, I really want to see if they will ever consider, like, change, like, I've played, I've been playing, like, sub games with, like, my Twitch subs and just being like, okay, let's just nerf damage by 10%, and nerf healing by 10%. And like all that that does really is make fights longer and more aim reliant and healing is less impactful. So like hitting three shots as McCree is like really, really good because now a soldier can't just like two click and rocket you and you wind up in like more skirmishy type deals and ults are automatically like less prevalent because you're doing less damage and like you don't touch the ult rate. And then maybe like you just up move speed just to see what it's like to play without a Lucio and like the game is like vastly different. And I think that like just having that option to play these weird custom games is just like way, way more fun than just like grinding ranked all day. And also in theory, it allows people to actually roughly look at what a change might be to a yeah. as opposed to just speculate in their brain. Like, oh, if you just change this one like this, it's like, well, in fact, actually that's one of the big flaws I think with all MOBA type games is that nearly always you adjust something and you try and take into account every variable, but it is literally impossible. And then when you add in pro players as well, like there's no way you can know what the impact of a change to a hero is going to be when you throw it into the wild and then have the best players in the world abuse it constantly, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like, I switched the damage to 0.9, and suddenly I was like, huh, I didn't change Zarya's bubbles here, so now I'm actually just getting zero charge of Zarya. Or, like, maybe Roadhog just never dies now, because he still heals at X rate. It's, you, yeah, I mean, that's true. It's just, I like the idea of having more control, at least, and just, like, seeing what things are. I mean, I like the idea, uh, like I said, not only so that you can practice very specific things and set your cooldowns to zero so that you can more efficiently practice as a pro player, but I think that it's like you get enough people who are going to be making custom games and, and trying new things, and, and maybe you're going to find something that the devs couldn't find in terms of, okay, well, we changed these game modes, but actually the, the game plays a lot better now with this specific set of exactly. uh, changes. And then if they make those changes into the real game as well, it's just it's more data for Blizzard to work with um, and gives people an opportunity to test out uh, you know, like you say, what would happen if it was the damage was slightly lower within the game? What effect does that have on the game? Can I make a good argument that this is how the professional scene should be played from now on, or this is how should competitive the ranked ladder should work? I think it's really cool. Card speed, I, I changed card speed. That was good. Just make it faster. Let offense win more, <laughs> so you get better time bank games. And like cough maps turn more often, and like you finish two CP more often. Like you, if you start messing with cap times too, like the game is very different and like arguably faster. So it's uh, there's a lot of things you can do. I saw Clockwork today streaming. It was like playing like this game mode of like four seventy sixes at like half speed against Sombras with like five hundred HP and like two hundred percent speed, and it's like Alien versus <laughs> Predator. It, like you can do so much wonky stuff, and players are going to get so much better. Like it's players are actually just going to be so much better in a couple of years. Uh, I mean, I, I'd still like to see there be an actual, uh, which they've said, not that they're working on the short term, but they've said they'd like to do eventually having a map editor would also be fucking sick, right? Yeah. Uh, eventually for this game. so that, And Blizzard has a history of having map editors in their game, like we look at StarCraft and having be, people be able to create new game modes and new maps from scratch. It would, be, it would be pretty fun to be able to see that within Overwatch because one of my favorite parts about my history of watching Blizzard titles is like Brood War was balanced via maps. It was all, none of it was really made by Blizzard. You know, StarCraft II, a lot of the Korean map makers had their maps introduced into the ladder pool. Um, it would be fun to really open it up to everybody and then reward people for, for having or creating really good maps. There's some really talented people out there. I mean, I came from TF2 most recently and like, there's a there's like entire communities of just really, really good map makers. And like as that game evolved, they just started putting more and more of them into the game as default. Like it would be sick to see how someone from that community specifically could like make some crazy Overwatch game modes and types even. Yeah, and it's not only about the competitive scene, it's about the casual scene too. Yeah. Where if in Warcraft 3, I mean, Dota literally is just a custom map that was made for Warcraft 3. Think about what people could maybe do in Overwatch as well if you tweak enough of the settings. So mm -hmm. hopefully that'll be in Overwatch sooner rather than later. I doubt it'll be this year, but maybe we'll get... I want, I want 8v8 and 10v10. I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. I want, like, the <laughs> craziest. Really? Yeah, just for pubbing. Like, why not? Why not just throw 8 Pharahs into the sky against 8 Widowmakers? I don't know. Like, that sounds awesome. I mean, I, I mean the obvious answer is spam. Like, wouldn't that just be a nightmare to play in, in 10v10 I mean, like, servers? How could you ever yeah. come around with certain corners? Just be idiots just spamming it all the time, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Some maps would be completely unplayable. Oh, yeah, right? I mean, obviously, but... <laughs> that would be fun, I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> if you were the one doing the spamming, always spam first, kids. That's my <laughs> advice to the youth of today. Always spam first. Okay, I've got a question for you, Flame. This will test you to your limit. Who is the best okay. Korean Overwatch player? I'm tempted to say Nanohana right now, or Flower. I don't think anyone's really outskilled him in like my eyes recently. I felt like Bird Ring had a really good showing as an individual, just being able to like flex from the the year. he was playing everything I think in his matches, but he went from like being a really good Roadhog last season of Apex to now he's like playing Genji. I think I saw him McCree. And who did I? I just watched someone that was all over the place too. There's someone. There's so few players right now that can swap between heroes that like when you see the ones coming between like. 76 Genji McCree. I think it was last night. I don't know who I just watched. There was a player. <laughs> I'm trying to remember now. But 
I'll say Nano Hana for now. His Farah too, right? That was him on the. He was playing Farah on like Oasis, mm-hmm. and he was just destroying yep. people. It wasn't even. It wasn't even like. It was just like a slaughterhouse. Like you felt bad for them to take high on that map because they just had no idea what to do. Um, I, I think Flower is definitely a good one. I'd I'd add Ryu J Hong in there because I think he is definitely the best Ana player in the world. It depends on how much you value that flexibility, but. To me, it's been impressive that Jae Hong has been able to play off of Ana and play D.Va. Obviously, hasn't been doing that that recently, but I mean, I I watched this guy on fucking Ana, and it's just absolutely ridiculous. The the amount of like one v ones he can win. So it's he's basically 1v3. like, yeah, he's basically like impossible to kill in the back line, and he still he gets more kills on Ana than anybody else too. It's it's really really impressive to watch him play. Um, so I think he's definitely like. One of the players you could put up there, Bird Ring, as you said, has been doing really well. Panker um, has been impressive. So I don't know. It's there. It really just depends on whether you you're evaluating based on position, right? Who's the best one? If you want to say, okay, well, it has to be a DPS player. It has to be somebody with a large hero pool. Um, changes your answer clearly, but mm. damn, Jay Hong is super good. Jay Hong's on another level, I think. He's like. I mean, if Miro is Winston was meta, I mean, like Winston and Miro might be in there, you know? It's just not his patch, but yeah, Jay Hong is like his own. He's in his own world right now, I think. Yeah. Okay. What do you. What do you think of the, the gap between the best Koreans and the, the best Westerners? Like, are the best Westerners just as good as the Koreans? Are they better? Are they worse? Where, did, where in your mind do you conceptually put them in the bottom of flame? Uh, definitely on the same level, I think. I mean, at least from an individual standpoint, I think, like, the aiming and the positioning, like, you have, here, you have players like Chips. I would put Chips on, like, close to the same level as Jae Hong. I think you could argue that Tavik is just as good as Flower, if not better, I mean, just like there's players like Soon on like Tracer who can probably out Tracer Bunny, you know, like they're, Stitch. They're like they're playing really well, but I don't think that like they're on. I don't think individually anyone's like super super outskilling the Western players. And I think that there's definitely Western. I think there might be more Western talent on like a personal level, but obviously the teamwork over in Korea right now is just phenomenal it's like getting really phenomenally good like last season i was like monty would be like oh korea is so great and i was like no i don't i'm not seeing it but this season i'm like blown away actually by like how much better all of these teams have gotten like who saw kung du panther just like taking Fnatic out like so handedly it it's impressive must be an unfamiliar situation to be in there monty you tell him <laughs> korea is really good they were like i just don't see it i think these western people are pretty good and now gradually they go they're, 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 they are pretty good. Yep, they're the best. Okay. So, <laughs> it didn't take his, long. his was quick, though. His was a very quick road to Damascus. <laughs> I mean, type yeah. scenario. We'll see how C9 does. They're like the wild card. Oh, my right God. Now. Right. So, this guy is like a fucking fan of the old NRG lineup, and he's putting his faith in Cloud9 as wild card. Like. Well, they're the, they're the only oh, wild card. Like, they have no results. They have the new roster. They have no. Okay. They have a clean slate, as far as I'm concerned. Okay. So, because he, he hasn't look, seen the fail yet. Combat Spirit. Uh, coming in with gods. We're going to see how they actually do. Obviously, Africa Blue is going to be a bigger test for them. I don't think C9 has any hope of beating Kongdu Unsia, but if they can win that next match against AF Blue, at least they're going to be guaranteed to go to the quarterfinals. So, given AF Blue's current condition, I would say I'd actually put them as a favorite, you know? But. Yeah. See, here's, the, here's another thing. This is because what I always. I'm at least honest, right, that I can't really put my mind in the position of someone from a totally different culture because I can't imagine what they're, what, how they would think or conceive of the world. So really, it's just me in their bre- in their body, you know? And so I, I would also, some top, if I was Korean, this would be my top tier trash talk at the moment. Like after the game, when you really just wreck them so hard, you know, when you're doing like you're shaking hands, you say like, listen, sorry, I, I, can't, I can't be seen talking to you in public very often. Uh, this much rather and then they go what do you mean and you go well you know it's all happened to the last guy talking to his butchers out in public 
and then you just fade away, just fade away. That's what you just fade. You just move backwards. You don't even, you don't even say anything. You just give them the face, <laughs> face, and then you move back. Just a wink, wink, and walk yeah. off. Sadly, there's not that, there's not that much BM in the Korean scene. They have to keep it like under wraps. Although here's the interesting thing, Flame. Like we actually know from other esports games that have had Koreans in, there are some Koreans that are like mega, like rages and over the top. But as a result, the way that they deal with it in Korea is they are just like. It's almost like you you live in a convent if you are in a Korean esports team, and they just repress the shit out of all that stuff. But it means if it ever spills over, it becomes epic. Like in League of Legends, we had an amazing one. It was so underrated, where the two best AD carries in League of Legends like hated each other to the extent that one of them was found in like a chat, like a, lo a private log that got leaked, where he's <laughs> saying some shit like like that if someone even says that the other guy's better at one aspect of the game than him it makes his blood <laughs> boil and all, all this like mad shit like that. it was just completely going off like it's, the level of seething jealousy and hatred was unreal and i love that shit unlike na where the jealousy seething rage and hatred is just up all out on front street right and everyone can see it every day of the week on twitch.tv slash that near person's name so i think that is a convenient way to wrap the shop do you have any final <laughs> message for the viewers flame apart from watch all your stuff it's better than monty's you do the whole game since you do the game after the game it's better than no, monty. I, mean, like, yeah. I, I like having monty in the <coughs> scene too it's just like it's it pushes me right like if he's putting out better content or i feel like his content is more valuable than it like puts a new light. well so let, let us know if that ever happens so yeah keep us up to date keep us I up will. And maybe on that day, you'll come back to the show and we'll have another episode. <laughs>